right, Dr. Agatz, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've wrote multiple publications, books. You've been everywhere, but uh, your current book that uh, you get on pre-release on July 25th, I, I think what a time for a book like that to come out with everything going on in the world. And all you got to do is look at stats. And uh, for a guy like yourself to dive into that, not that you haven't before, but you had to have seen, and I always like to ask people how they got where they're at, but I will get to that later. But I've seen guys write these books and they're taking advantage of the time that we're in. So, you know, it's a crappy time, whatever. So I'm just going to reword something, put it out because I have a big following and make money. But obviously, if any, anybody knows anything about you, that's not the type of guy that you are. You know, it's, it's true. Well, you're, first, thank you so much for having me. A pleasure. I, I would have loved to meet you in person as we were originally supposed to. Hopefully, we'll do that another time. Uh, I'm always envious of people who either live in Southern California or, in your case, I think it's Palm Beach. So uh, yeah. consider yourself envied, sir. Uh, oh, I told anyways, Tony, I told Tony, no, you better fly his ass in here within a month or two. Or <laughs> well, if, if I schedule it, sir, you'll be in London. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, Thank you for that opening question. So the the way that I thought about writing this book, it, it, I actually discuss it in the first chapter of, of the book. I found that oftentimes whenever I would weigh in with something positive in my social media engagement, that oftentimes was the stuff that would get the most you know positive feedback. So of all the times that I've been on Joe Rogan's show, probably the clip that is you know, the the most commented on is when I described, you know, what is what was my secret to to losing all the weight that I did and going back to being slim. Yeah. And so so I've never thought about sort of entering the 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 happiness uh you know book writing market, but I saw the kind of reaction that it instilled in people. Yeah. And they often wrote to me saying, you always seem to be playful, even when you're dealing with serious issues. You always have a sense of humor. There's always a twinkle in your eye. Well, what's your secret, Dr. Saad? Mm -hmm. So then I thought, you know, the last book, The Parasitic Mind, was about, you know, negative in your mind. brain worms that infect our brain. So I thought, well, why don't I now complete the circle and write a book about positive mindsets, about positive ways by which we can tackle life. So it's really a combination of, a lot of personal anecdotes. That's what makes it truly unique. And then coupled with ancient wisdoms and the latest science, you know, from neuroscience, from well-being research, from happiness research, put it all together. And hopefully I've come up with something that people will enjoy. Yeah. And uh, real quick, <clears throat> I watched that when I came out. Why did they take that down? You, uh, Doc lost 87 pounds. He was doing 10,000 steps a day. Oh, it, much more than 10,000. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Oh, oh no, no. sorry. 10,000. I don't, don't why. Sorry, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, just because I, I want people to get the right Yeah, hell yeah. So give me for interrupt. I, I do. So I haven't done less than 10,000 since June 2019. But my average is usually between 15 and 20,000 a day. Wow. And between 15 and 1,700 calories per day. That's how I lost 86 pounds. 86 pounds. And they pulled it? What? They pulled, yeah. Why did they pull that? I don't think they pulled that one. You, you, you're thinking about the Joe Rogan episode that they yanked down? Yeah. It's not that one. It's I think it's the one before that, or maybe two ago, mm -hmm. where he used in our conversation. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's because he used the N word. Oh, jeez. Uh, at, uh. at some point, we were discussing something, and he said the N word. And I remember thinking, oh, boy. This is gonna come back to to haunt us, and I think that's the one that was yanked, not not the latest one with the weight loss. Yeah, I, I was just watching the, the clips of that one because I watched the other ones when uh, you were in the red studio and and everything else. Yeah. Um, and you know, bringing up the weight loss th that goes into your book about resilience. Exactly. So uh, in, in in one of the last chapters, I talk about the anti fragility of failure, and you know, the importance of persistence and and resilience. And so, uh, you know, in the same way that when you complete a marathon, I mean, I know it sounds like a cliche, but when you complete a 42.2 kilometer marathon, which is 
point something miles. Oh, it really you. is one step at a time. And then one, and at some point, four hours into the run, I did two marathons, by the way, oh. in 85 and 86. And both of them, I finished in the four hour range. Oh. Uh, it's one step at a time. So when it came to the weight loss, it's very hard when you, you try to imagine the, the amount that you have to lose, you feel desperate. I mean, how, how am I ever going to lose, you know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds? Well, there is no magic recipe. It literally is making the exact correct choice every single day for 18 months. And then suddenly you get on the scale and you're a svelte 170 pounds. I mean, it, it really, but at, so, so what I did is I tried to break it up. Why don't I try to get to, uh, because the highest I was at was 256. And I was 256. And how and, tall are you, you know, Doc? I'm, I'm sorry to I'm interrupt not, you. I'm like 5'7 on a Whoa. very good day when my hair is spiked. <laughs> uh, so so I'm I'm the average soccer player, you know, the, yeah. the smaller, you know, skillful soccer players. So, you know, I'm not a 6'4 guy. So 256 for a guy my height was really... Now, I wore it well in the sense that it was distributed you know it's not like i was super skinny with a massive belly and so i could some i mean i clearly was much heavier you could see it but i wore it reasonably well but i knew that you know i was getting into my 50s i had young children and i thought okay well COVID is here we can't go anywhere let's turn this dreadful pandemic experiment into something positive why don't i use this opportunity to lose all the weight that I've been meaning to lose. Because I had always been very thin until about the age of 25. I was grossly underweight. I even, I don't know if you, you've ever seen, I, I post these clips when I was a young soccer player with the eight abs and so on. Well, that was me until about 23, 24, 25. And then once, you know, my soccer playing days were over, uh, I started putting on slowly weight. Here's 10 pounds. Here's another eight. Oh, look, I just hit 200. Oh, look, I just hit 225. And so what I basically did is I just set these, these markers. Why don't I try to lose in the next four months, you know, 20 pounds and try to maintain it. And bit by bit, bit by bit, here I am, 170 pounds. So and I, and you I can do it. And I see that you implemented that in the book, uh, Truth and Happiness, the eight secrets for leading a good life, you know, just with that resilience alone that you're speaking of. But that, can you pull up a uh, tab too? Mm -hmm. uh, is book, which you can order, pre-order now and comes out July 25th. But when you say resilience, okay, that that's part of it and, and you speak about it and it, it's a marker in the book here. Uh, but when you get too resilient, whether it's work or you become an extremist or so on and so forth. So if, if you get obsessed with losing that weight, walking no less than 10 steps, another part in your book is, you know, still having spice, still having moderation, so on and so forth. How do you balance the two? Yeah, fantastic question. So in an earlier chapter in, the, in that book, uh, I have a whole chapter on you know, everything in moderation, which of course, the, not only the ancient Greeks, there are many, many different uh, philosophical frameworks had thought about the idea of, now, everything in moderation could be mathematically demonstrated with an inverted U-curve, right? If, if you do too little of something. So think about, for example, perfectionism. If you're not at all perfectionist, uh, let's say you're writing a book. Well, if you're not at all perfectionist, you don't check your facts carefully. You're not very careful in checking your references. You, you know, you, you're not detail oriented. If you're too perfectionist, so either too little or too much, if you're too perfectionist, as I am, well, when you receive the galley proofs of your book, you go into a whole anxiety episode because so the galley proofs, for those of you who don't know, is, you know, the final version of the book that this is your last chance to go through it to identify any errors because otherwise it's going to to press it's going to print and so i sit there and i obsess over every single syllable so that you know i will spend days and days reviewing every single detail with the hope of maybe finding one comma <laughs> out of place well yeah. well that's putting me too far on the other end of the curve right i'm right. too perfectionist had, had instead of having spent two weeks reading the galley proofs i had spent one week maybe that would have improved you know increased my productivity to pursue other things so and what i what i show in that book uh, chapter is that that inverted you the everything in moderation 
is probably the singular most important universal law for leading the good life, right? And so Aristotle himself, the yeah. ancient Greek philosopher, had talked about the golden mean. So he said, for example, that if you have a, a soldier who is very cowardly, well, that's very bad. But if you have a soldier who is reckless in his courage, well, that's also very bad because he's going to basically martyr himself. He's going to kill himself in a reckless way. That there is some point in the middle, some sweet spot, some temperance. And so to your question, you always have to be mindful of that inverted U because it applies across so many contexts. C can I maybe mention one or two other examples I, of yeah, the inverted U? Yeah, take your time. Right. Click on um, read more uh, because it's, it's interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, take your time. Take your time because uh, uh, under the description. Sorry, I can't. Because I'm very into uh, the way ancients did things because they didn't take pills. They didn't do this. They found the way, you know? Exactly. Uh, look, uh, let's take, for example, uh, intensity of exercise and the efficacy of the exercise. That itself turns out to be defined by an inverted U shape, meaning that if you if you exercise at a too low intensity, you don't get your cardiovascular system, you know, to be at the right range. If you exercise with too great intensity, that's also has all sorts of negative downstream effects. And so there is a sweet spot in the middle. Let's take, for example, jealousy in a in a relationship. If you never exhibit any jealousy, then your partner will think that you are insufficiently vested in them. And oftentimes your partners will try to trigger jealousy in you if only to get a reaction out of you yeah. that shows that you are committed to them. Now, take it to the other extreme. If you are pathologically jealous, then you become an abusive spouse <laughs> somewhere in the middle between complete neglect neglectfulness where you you never exhibit any territoriality or jealousy and obsessive pathological territoriality lies the sweet spot and so what i do in that chapter is i demonstrate across a bewildering number of situations that more often than not what makes us happy what makes us content is to find that sweet spot now, to your earlier question, it's tough to say that there is a singular sweet spot for every individual, right? Because it depends on each individual, right? But what we do know is that we all adhere to the sweet spot, to the inverted you. My optimal point may be different from yours, but we both adhere to that inverted U shape. And so being mindful of that allows me, for example, let's take resilience, right? If you're not at all resilient, you'll never meet any of your goals. If you are so resilient that you never disengage from a goal that is otherwise unattainable, then you'll be chasing shadows for the rest of your life, right? Oh, so for yeah. example, imagine I wish to be a Hollywood actor. Well, it's you should jump into that dream. But if you're now 65 years old and you've been a... Uh, server at a restaurant waiting for your break well maybe you've gone overboard with your resilience curve in other words you should have you should have disengaged earlier so pretty much any phenomenon that you can think of tommy i can demonstrate to you that that rule applies too little is not good too much is not good find that middle point this episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30% lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss. You name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So if you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS media and get 25% off your test using the code MSCS media. The link is in the description at the top.
This episode is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Breaking news, Manscaped now sells beard products. That's right, they are once again revolutionizing men's grooming with brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. From a beard trim to a fresh shave, the technology behind Beard Hedger Pro Kit allows you to shave your signature beard look. Now you can finally use Manscaped products to make your drapes match your carpet by going to manscaped.com and using code MSCS Media for 20% off and free shipping. No one likes a weird beard, so say goodbye to all the stubble trouble with Manscaped's Pro Beard Kit. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. This thing is a monster of fixing faces. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard. No more messing around in drawers, this color one, that color one, all with one guard. Plus it's waterproof, so you can shave in the shower and avoid all that hair in the sink. The Pro Kit doesn't end there though. First, there's the beard shampoo and conditioner. You need to remember your hair is different. Next, Manscaped's beard oil. Cap it off with beard balm. The Pro Kit also comes with three different gifts, a beard brush, comb and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress so get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code mscs media at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off and free shipping at manscaped.com use the code mscs media but how do you let's take uh elon musk or uh or me for example you you know if like i gotta i get obsessed with things and i go extreme and I'll stay I'll stay up till five and get up at six for he'll tell you for three months if that's what it takes to figure it out. If it's a coding thing, if it's a podcast thing, I want an award. I open up <laughs> this is a funny story. I'll tell you when you come in. But I opened up an engineering firm for a weird for a funny reason actually. I knew nothing about it. But I had hired like retired guys that I knew that just didn't want to be around their wife all day anymore. Anyway, I want an award. But I had I had uh, gotten extreme with it, where I was going to win no matter what, and I always have a tough time personally finding a balance between when I get my mind on something that I want to succeed in, and then having time to do anything else. Like I can't tell you the last the last movie I watched was Air. I was curious about that movie Air with Ben Affleck, but other than that, I haven't sat down and just watched a movie in probably three or four years. So I'm one of those extremists where I'm resilient, but too resilient where I do nothing but work from day to night. So when someone's in that and I and I I'm sorry and I agree with you, if you're it's tough to be happy, even if you get a gazillion dollars, how do you break that? Well, but I don't think you were being. So let's suppose you had started that engineering firm and it had now been 10 years into that uh, endeavor and every single environmental cue that you were getting from the environment was suggesting that this is a losing ship would you remain in that sinking ship or yeah. would there be an exit point where you'd get out well that so Good point. Th- th- if you answer that you would get out that yeah. means you are moderating your resilience right oh. the, so resilient is is you know is in the wrong part of the curve when no amount of incoming information could ever have me disassociate from that goal. And that can't be a good thing, right? So as I said, resilient. So if I'm not in the least bit resilient, I can't meet any objective, right? Because most worthwhile, purposeful things require some grit, some stick to itness. But if I say, La, 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 la. No amount of information is ever going to convince me that this restaurant is going to fail. I've now taken all the money from every family member and it's now 10 years into the process and I'm still not willing to disengage. Well, then I've clearly passed the sweet right. spot. So, you know, it's it's it varies depending on the individual. It varies depending on the domain. But as I said, what is absolutely clear is that nearly all phenomena that you could think of, Tommy, whether it be at the individual level, at the group level, at the economic level, they all follow that inverted you. Even the pursuit of happiness itself follows an inverted you, yeah. if I can blow your mind, right? Yeah. If you don't follow happiness in the least bit, that's not good. If you're pathological in your willful pursuit of happiness, that also turns out to be bad. So even the pursuit of happiness follows an inverted U shape. Right. You're right. Not that I thought you were wrong, but when when I really, <laughs> when I processed it, you're right. Now, I, another point in your book, 
which I, I can you just bring it out earlier, like June first or something? <laughs> you know, could he's got. Can I kill tell it. you something? Yeah, I was just forgive me for interrupting. <laughs> no, you, no, I'm I don't. Really, I'm just excited. Uh, to your point about you wanted earlier, I was sitting with my wife uh, uh, having a coffee today, and I looked at her and I said, "I don't know. I'm so antsy. You know, it's so hard to wait." Shit, well, hey, and and to your point, nuts. when you said earlier, you know, you're not writing this book to make, you know. Thank you for kind of pointing to the, to my purity of spirit. It's sure. not even because I'm excited to make the money. You know what excites me? It's when someone sends a selfie on Twitter holding a copy of my book. They're sitting in Dubai and they say, I'm reading your book. So let's say The Parasitic Mind, my last book. And I'm loving it so much. Thank you so much, Professor Saad. That to me is like a million dollars, right? So I... I was actually sitting with her today and a gentleman came up to me whom I've seen at the coffee shop often, but I, I never thought that, you know, he was a follower of my work. So he comes from behind me and in a very kind of warm way, puts his hands around my shoulders and I turn like this and he says, I just have to tell you, I just watched you on Pierce Morgan's. I just love listening to you. And I thought that was, that was a million bucks right there. Right? Because the, the fact that you can bring happiness to someone because they're consuming either your, you know, this conversation or or the books, that's what, and, and by the way, that speaks to something in the book that I talk about, which is try to find a profession that makes you wake up every day, kind of rubbing your hands excited, right? I was, I mean, I don't even know you prior to today, but I was excited because I'm going to be given a platform, you know, that with a very successful platform where I can just talk about ideas and I get ultimately paid for doing that. My God, I'm a kid in the candy store. I must be the luckiest guy in the world. <clears throat> so if you could find some profession that offers you that kind of, you know, existential glee, then you you won the game of life. It's because you're not American. That's yeah. why. It's because yeah. you're not American. That's why. That. Or we call why? it, well, we call it over here old school. So old school, like I grew up in Philadelphia, so did he. And in Philadelphia, it's very old school, Italians or Irish or whatever, you know, and, and growing up where, you know, if you don't hold that door for that lady, oh boy, when you get home, you're in trouble, you know? So, and, and through that being raised like that, you can have all the money in the world, but when somebody sits there and reads or watches something that you came up with and developed, you can't buy that. Once you That's have money, so you can't buy that. And then a guy like you comes along and you're not like a showboat. And you know, the guys that I'm talking about, everybody's a speaker. Everybody's a, I don't know what they're called. You know, everybody's got to say coach. Co oh yeah. Everybody's life a coach. coach. A life, life coach. coach. Life, life, life coach. Life yeah. Coaches. I actually wrote an article about <laughs> the scam of life, life coach. coaches. Yep. I, you have someone who has been divorced six times but they are a marriage coach and they're 20 and they're, the and they're 28 yeah. and they're 28. They're divorced six times. They got three kids they are 28 years old and they're a marriage coach, just who I want to go to, but they got a following. So they go and they buy it. So when I saw you wrote this book, really, because, uh, you know, we've seen it just in here and walking around so many people are depressed. And everybody's got anxiety and, you know, I know you know some, but you probably couldn't even imagine how many lives you saved. And you're very kind. And knowing that you're from Lebanese and not America, no offense to America, but you find me, a, I could probably count on my hands how many Americans would do it from their heart. But you know how many lives you probably saved? I mean, really. Thank you. You're very kind. You're and very I'm not kind. just saying this because you're here on some dumb Zoom. I hate Zoom. I wish we were sitting right here. I agree. Uh, well, hopefully we'll do it again. Uh, look, uh, that's one of the reasons why I, uh, to, to, to your first question, why I decided to write the book, because, you know, I sometimes I would, someone will write to me, you know, explain, to, why are you always happy? So then I write and I say something like, well, you know, I have a, a lovely wife, wonderful children. When I go out there and fight the good fight, then I can come home to the solace of my home. I wish you the same. To me, it seems pretty self-evident to say that, but yet the person will then write me, you know, a, a six paragraph letter saying how much that affected them, how how much, you know, as you, to your point. And so that's why I thought, you know what, let me let me write this book. And, and as you said, it's not arrogant, right? It's not, no. I, I'm not promising, here is the absolute secret sauce 
to leading the good life because that would mean I don't have what's called epistemic humility. Epistemic humility means I know what I know and I know what I don't know and I know the limits of my knowledge and what I can promise. So I can't, so I don't do the self help stuff, just come to my seminar and I'll tell you all the secrets to life. But what I can tell you is <laughs> that there is a set of mindsets that if you adhere to them, if you adopt them, it increases your chances of being happy, right? Life is a statistical game, right? You could be a non-smoker your whole life and yet regrettably be stricken with lung cancer. But if you want to put all the odds on your side, don't smoke. It reduces your chances of lung cancer. So it's in that spirit that I wrote the book. There is nothing definitive. It's not memorize my book and I promise you eternal bliss. <laughs> what I, so, so example. Now to, pay to me. Your earlier point, yeah. <laughs> to your earlier point about uh, opening the, the you know the door and uh, so on. So I talk about one in, in one of the early chapters. I talk about the two most important decisions that you'll ever make to either increase your happiness or increase your misery. Choosing the right spouse and choosing the right profession. Well, the next question would be, well, what, how do you, how do you know that you're choosing the right spouse? Well, you never absolutely know, but you could certainly be attuned to certain cues that the prospective spouse engages in that can either tell you she's a, he or she are a potential winner or not. And to your point earlier about being Italian and from Philly, well, although the movie I think was in New York, do you remember in Bronx Tale? And yeah, I actually Lilo. talked about this in the book. Lilo Brancato's you... a good friend. Yeah, yeah he's, exactly. he's, he's a well, personal you... friend. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I saw that he was on your show. So you must uniquely then remember the the door test in yeah. the movie. Yep. Yep. The yeah, yeah. The best part of the movie. The best part of the movie. Yeah. Now, so I talk about that in the book, and then I try to come up with a instance in my life that corresponded to the door test when my wife and I met. So Lilo's going to go crazy yeah. when I text him after this, that you put that, oh, he's going to, uh, oh boy, he's going to get all excited down there. <laughs> so, so here we go. I'm, I'm giving you guys a lot of premiere content before the book is out. So I, I explain in the book how my wife and I met. So the way, the way we met, which speaks to the magic and the, the randomness of life. I was at the gym. I mean, I was single. I was at the gym, uh, exercising and a guy passes by whom you know i didn't really know well but he you know we knew each other and he just s says hello he just says hey professor how you doing i said oh hi how you doing another guy whom i had never met had heard that salutation so he comes up to me now this is this is 23 24 years ago so i'm i'm looking a lot yeah I'm, i look like i'm 12. i don't have the white beard i don't have the white hair so he comes up to me he goes i'm sorry i i heard this gentleman address you as professor are you are you really a professor i said yes he said in which fields what do you you know what what are your specialties so i tell him so he goes oh you know i'm i'm the ceo of this company uh i'm trying to set up some in-house executive education for my executives can i interest you in maybe coming for maybe six or seven saturdays giving us different lectures you know one week we could talk about psychology of consumer behavior, psychology of advertising, you know, maybe your evolutionary psychology, you know, whatever. So we struck a deal. We, we, we signed the contract and I'm going to come to the second to this, something similar to the door test of Bronx tale. So bear with me. No, no, uh, take a so, I love, I love, I, I love how things happen. You know, Cause that's how, uh, that's how then for me and, and, and for the listeners, when you talk like this, like how you met your wife. So don't ever apologize because it just goes to show you, you you're not pulling these steps out of your ass. You, you know, it's life experiences, you know? Exactly. exactly. And, and incidentally, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that you're talking about stories because one of the things that I'm very mindful in these books, whether it be the parasitic mind, whether it be the consuming instinct, which was earlier, or whether it be this forthcoming book, the other books that I've written are much more scientific and technical. So I'm only talking here about the books meant for the general public. I specifically incorporate tons of personal stories for two reasons. Number one, it, you build yeah. intimacy with the reader, right? Yeah. It, to, to simply talk in the abstract, here's what Aristotle said, here's what the latest neuroscience, that's all good. But if I could then demonstrate the phenomenon by telling you a gripping story, not only do I build intimacy with you, 
But we are a storytelling animal. We love to learn through stories. So I can give you all the fancy neuroscience, but that's not going to stick with you as compared to me telling you a story about how I met my wife and how it relates to the Bronx tale. That's the stuff that makes people go, I can't put this book down, you know? Yeah, that's so, why I, so I want to know. That's why I'm like, don't say sorry. Tell me, tell me. We want to know, <laughs> you know? It was good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, okay. So, so I show up first day to this company and the the elevator door opens and the, the woman who is greeting me to take me to the room where I'll be lecturing to the executives turns out to be my future oh, wife. Boy. She says, oh, are you are you Professor Saad? I say, <laughs> yes. Oh, let me take you to the room. So then now we're going to come to the door test. So about <laughs> or, or my version of the door test. So about three I think it was either the second or third Saturday. Remember, I, I think I did six Saturdays. Uh, I used to be, before I lost all my weight, very prone to getting sick, getting bronchitis. Uh, I used to be asthmatic. So whenever I'd get a cold, then I'd be super sick for the next six weeks with this really nasty kind of bronco asthma. And so one of those Saturdays, I was sick. And as I was trying to get through these two, three hour lectures, I mean, I was just coughing incessantly. So at the break, I, so I call a break. Okay, let's, hey guys, let's take a 10 minute break, go get lunch or whatever, get a coffee. My future wife, who to me was just an, a nondescript, you know, I'm very professional, right? I'm not, you know, uh, even though it's not the same ethical guidelines as would be the case in a university setting. This was, you know, a, a consulting gig. This was with, you know, adults in a, in a company, I'm still, you know, very serious and detached and professorial. Well, she goes downstairs, gets a tea and comes back and gives me the tea as a response to seeing how much I'm struggling, you know, with my cough. That was my door test. So someone who can be so considerate that she decides on her own that you know she's feeling the empathy of this guy is struggling he's got to get through these three hours of lectures let me go get him a tea that to me demonstrated that she's very giving she's selfless and so in a sense that was the unlocking of the door from the bronx tale i see so you go you're not asking her for anything she just sees you're struggling and she takes the initiative to go down there and get you some hot tea to help you out Exactly right. But professor, now, all you that, had to do is use your last name, Sad. You could have played that card. <laughs> oh man, you could have, you know, yeah, my last name, Sad. Oh, you could have got it. <laughs> I'm going to give you another little nugget from the from our. So the first time we went to see a movie, very old school. You were mentioning old school Philadelphia. We were accompanied by a chaperone, one of her friends. She didn't feel, you know, she she wanted yeah. someone to be around. Uh, which, okay, it's, it's perfectly fine. So this is after you had finished the course and so on. And there was no grading in the course, so there was no ethical issue and so on. So we go to see a movie. We went to see, by the way, The Insider with Al Pacino. He oh, plays yeah. Yeah. he plays uh, a whistleblower, insider yeah. whistleblower who's whistleblowing on the tobacco industry. Yeah. Now, my okay. dad had just had a health scare maybe a month or two earlier. So this, now this is 1999, so we don't, uh, cell phones are not widespread. And I tend to be a, a late adopter to a lot of these technologies. I mean, I only got a cell phone, I think about five or six years ago. So, so I got a pager, which is not at all my style, but I got a pager in case my dad needed to reach me, uh, you know, with an emergency. So as we were leaving one another on that first evening, so this is another one of those cues that you know she's going to be your future wife, hopefully. Uh, so, so we agree on a set of paging codes to communicate with each other. So if if she pages me 111, it means whatever. If she pages me 222, it means I'm thinking of you, literally, okay? So we leave each other after seeing that, that movie I, I turn the corner, so I'm no longer within her view. I'm maybe 40 feet, 40 meters away from her. My pager rings. I look up and I see 222. Oh. I said, I have to marry this woman. No yeah. games, no BS, no trying to establish dominant who's, oh. I like you. 
I want to be with you. Let's no fooling around, no games. And that's it. That and it happened. Sweet. So where are they at? Where are they at nowadays? You never, you know, where you, you got very lucky. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. But uh, finding finding a woman like that nowadays, boy, if you write a book on that one, man, <laughs> you, you, you have houses all over the world. <laughs> well, but so that's the point, right? I can't guarantee you that you'll find the right one. But what I can tell you is here are some decisional steps that you can take to at least make sure you're increasing your likelihood of finding the right one. So here's another example. Uh, I won't mention names because I don't want to embarrass them or something. There, there's a good friend of mine uh, who used to be a former student of mine who was dating a woman and he found out shortly before the marriage that she had lied to him about something truly consequential that should have absolutely put on the massive you know, fl uh, breaks, red flags, yet he didn't pay attention to those signals. He did get married. And then within a year or two, they were divorced and all kinds of horrible things ended up happening because you didn't pay attention to all of the information. People tell you the truth one way or the other, even when they're lying to you. If you are attuned, you should be able to pick up. There is that instinctual gut feeling that you have either that tells you that this person is the right one or that maybe they're not the right one. And by the way, one of the things that causes us to not see those cues is precisely because of the butterfly effect when we're early in a relationship where our our libidinal drives, our hormones are raging. And so we often get married to the wrong person because we think that the, the great sex that we're having for the past three months <laughs> is going to carry us when we're 25 years into a marriage and guess what? It doesn't. It take doesn't happen. happen. No, it you. doesn't. It happen. doesn't. <laughs> we call it the we call it the honeymoon phase. You know, yeah. you're you're the best guy on the planet, Tommy. You look great. Love you. Love you. Can I get you something? And then I, I think it's more, in my opinion, so that I get hit for this. Uh, the, the man three years later is like. You know what happened to the ropes we had in the bedroom? You know, <laughs> you know the very beginning. You throw them away. Wait, you're going to bed at ten? What what, what happened? What well, because the, the you know as a man, or I should say the people I hang out with, you know you look at them and they're they're fucking miserable. They're, they're like I don't know what happened. You know because they, like you said, they they were in that honeymoon phase, lost the libido, you know everything. And expect that to, you know, in tw in 15 years, especially after a kid, forget it. It's well, done after a kid for a little bit. But he still he still well, rocks the, the boat after he lost the weight, from what I saw. Do doctor, well, <laughs> sorry, sorry, doctor. When you talk about happiness, right? You know, I've, yes, I've always I've always heard, and and I I truly believe this, that if you're not happy with yourself, you can't make someone else happy. And until you find oh. that happiness it could be a miserable time. So how how do you approach or, or tell people, like, be happy with yourself first? It sounds very selfish sometimes, right? Like, I have to take care of me first, and, be, and it seems selfish, but how do you balance that? Yeah, wow, that's an amazing question. Uh, look, we all vary, just like most things in life. There are individual differences on any trait, right? So, th so in the book, by the way, at the start of the book, I say that, about 50% of your happiness stems from your genes. Now, that might sound like bad news in that it is inscribed. I, I either have an innate sunny disposition or I don't. But no, if 50% of happiness comes from your genes, that means there's still 50% to play for. There's the other 50% that is up to my willful decisions that I make. So to your point, we may vary across individuals in terms of how self-confident we are, uh, how structured and integral our personhood is. But that notwithstanding, I argue that existential authenticity, and I know it's a mouthful, let me explain it, that, that really is at the root of self-happiness, right? So remember the ancient Greeks, there was a, a, a maxim, a, a, a Delphic maxim in ancient Greece, know thyself, right? So... So the first road for me to be happy is to feel comfortable in my skin. So this is why, by the way, and, and I sometimes struggle with this, by the way, because sometimes I wonder if I'm too authentic. 
maybe authentic to a fault. So for example, I sometimes will go after someone on social media, not because I am mean, because I'm, I'm hardly that, but because I would consider it inauthentic if I didn't criticize someone just because they're a friend of mine, if they're, if they're spewing bullshit, right? So I think one of the reasons why, if I may say, I exude happiness, other than the fact that I'm lucky enough to have been born with a sunny disposition, is that there are no fissures, there are no cracks in my personhood. I present myself to the world as I am, and hopefully with all of my qualities and all of my faults, and hopefully my qualities outweigh my faults, and therefore you can hopefully appreciate me. There is no way to be ha happy if you don't have that sense of self-worth and that sense of authenticity. Now, the reason why I sometimes question it about whether I am too authentic, meaning on the inverted U curve, have I passed the sweet spot of authenticity, is because sometimes that might cause me to not hold my tongue and burn a bridge with, but it's never out of meanness. So, you know, I can relate. I'll give you an, so I can, can relate. You, can you? Absolutely, because like, say I say say I I say something to somebody. I have uh, a tough time. I just say it how I feel it. Now they'll take it like, you know, people or persons, they'll take it like I mean it. If I say, uh, you know, I cannot stand that you do this all the time. You, you know, you're wasting your time. You're getting nowhere. You know, you're watching some stupid ass show that means nothing. Why don't you like do? Why don't you just try something else and make you may, maybe you'll get interested and you'll try. And I come off, and that's just an example. It's much worse. <laughs> but when it is much worse with with a couple bad words in it, I don't mean it like controlling or or you anything. mean it constructively. I mean it constructively because I care. But then people take it like, you know, I'm an asshole. And I've lost friends, burned bridges, and, and then I've come to the point where you, I think if you weren't as authentic, then you would lose that happiness because that's you, right? Exactly. And if they don't like it, then fuck, fuck them. Let them go get, hit the fucking road. Which, by the way, speaks to another, and there's another chapter in the book where I'm talking about regret and how to, so the ancient Greeks had this concept of ataraxia, which basically means tranquility of mind, right? Uh, and in the book, I argue that one of the things that gnaws at our existence the most is the what if, you know, should I have done this? What if I had done that? And so, and I talk about in the book, uh, there are two types of regrets that people typically, you know, obsess about. There's either what's called regret due to action versus regret due to inaction, right? This is actually the guy who pioneered this work is uh, my former, uh, in my PhD, uh, he's a professor of psychology, Tom Gilovich. Uh, so he basically talked about these two forms of regret. And he said that what people most regret are sources of inaction. So regret due to action would be, I regret that I cheated on my wife and that ruined my marriage. Regret due to inaction would be, I regret that I became a physician because my dad and my grand father were physicians, whereas really I've always wanted to be an artist. So it's an inaction. I never pursued my passion. And it turns out, gentlemen, over the long term, that the things that gnaw at us the most are regrets due to inaction, right? The, the road not taken. That's what really gnaws at our spirit. Now, why am I mentioning all this is because in, in that chapter, I talk about whether I should feel regretful for being the honey badger that I am, you know, had I modulated myself a bit better, maybe those idiots at University of California, whatever, would have given me that job landing me in Southern California. And I remember I was having this conversation on with Megan Kelly, uh, and I actually mentioned it in the book. And she looked at me and she said, no, exactly to the same point that you said when you said you shouldn't regret that because that's what makes you authentic. Uh, she said, no, you've built this huge audience. People resonate with you. People love you precisely because you're irascible and you tell it like it is. You're not mean. You're very 
kind, but you don't modulate. And, and so that kind of snapped it in my head because the thing that I was thinking about, oh, maybe I should hold my tongue is precisely what she was saying. No, no, that's that's what people love about you. So so even the one who's writing the book about regret <laughs> can, can themselves experience a sense of regret. And on that, and and on that, and it's it's a the little tiny sneak peek that we can only get on your book, there, uh, Professor. Um, you know, when somebody has that regret, and, and I think the, the probably the most percentage within that would be a guy or a girl who cheated on their wife, uh, husband, or a girlfriend, boyfriend, and they sit there and they 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 drink it away, pill it away. Or they're jaded and they think every guy that they meet next, even if it's a really good guy, is going to do the same thing. How do you break that? How, like, when you, you know, if you're someone listening, watching, how do you snap out of that? That's a tough thing to do. And a follow up to that, uh, something you had mentioned, you know, I hear people always, and I, this drives me absolutely insane. What if? What if? And the most thing that makes my head pop off of my neck, and please elaborate as long as you would like to on this one. Well, things are supposed to be like this. We should be doing this, or this isn't how things are supposed to be. And I always say, and I've lost, who the fuck told, what, what are you? Are, are you the book of life that told you, that can't, that, who came down and told you that this is how it should be? Oh, I know, and this is what I call it. Uh, from Cooper, <laughs> you got you got he you would it would be fun if you would talk to Rich Cooper. He's he's got these twenty. Who's uh, that? Uh, he made a gazillion dollars uh, with this alpha male thing and entrepreneur of cars. But one of the things, and it actually relates to your book, and I want to get to it, is the committee. And boy, do I know a lot about the committee. And and this relates to everything we're saying. I know I'm throwing a lot at you once, uh, but yeah, I, I'm trying to keep up here. Sorry. You know, but I'm I'm excited to talk to you as well. And thank you. But it all relates to your book. And the committee is when and this could be job related, as we had discussed. Uh this is very most in relationships. You and your wife get in an argument and you got lucky. She goes and calls the mom, the brother, friends, the whore friend down the street, the other bozo, the other bozo, the other bozo, the other bozo. And all the bozos and the other ones say, oh, you should leave them. Or with the job thing, oh, well, you make a lot, you know, that's a stable job, whatever. And now you really want to be an artist, but you're not. You're working in a warehouse, you know, with here and there you get promotions. But And then you're 80 years old, and when you come down here, you'll see it. You'll see these 80-year-old guys walking around, and they're dressed in... You know, I don't know what they had done before, but they're dressed in just crazy clothing or polos. Of course, they're with a hot girl because, you know, all their life they work to death. But you could just see that they found what they wanted to be. And I was friends with some of them. And I said, what did you do all your life? Oh, I worked on Wall Street and hated every bit of it. And then I would walk in and they would be painting at like 86. And I always wanted to be yeah. a painter, you know. Yeah, well, okay, there's a lot there to unpack. So, to, to your, <laughs> I can repeat it. There, there, there are so many different places I could go. So, I, I hope that I address all of your various threads. I'll try to tie it up. But to your earlier point, when you said, uh, you know, you have a fight and uh, she goes off to speak to her friend, whatever. So, let me offer you some tips uh, do. regarding <laughs> those kinds of issues. I'm not Please. necessarily you, but to your audience. Please do, sir. Uh, number <laughs> We never, we never go to bed angry. Yeah. And, and again, that sounds like a cliche, no. but I am allergic. And I think her too, but although maybe I might be even more intolerant of negativity. You, you know how when people fight, then they start pouting towards each other. There is silence. I'm not very good at that. I'm very, very communicative. Let's hash it out. Then let's hug it out. And then when we enter the sanctity of that bedroom, whether there is going to be sexy time or there isn't going to be sexy time, we have to end it on a loving note. So we we never, ever, I mean, literally, I've been with my wife for 23 years. Drive we nice. have never gone to bed angry at each other. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been moments of friction during a given day, but we finish it right there. We never, because when you let it language, 
it's like a corrosive poison. Mm -hmm. It's eating away at your existence. It's normal for me to be angry at her for something she did. It's normal for her to be angry at me for something I did. Let's resolve it. Let's kiss. Let's say I love you and let's move on. So that's number one. I'm trying to remember the other threads. What what, what were some <clears throat> other questions you asked? Sure. I'll start with the first one. So I'm sorry I threw all them at you like a like a, a machine gun. <laughs> so if if you're someone who say cheated on their spouse or vice right. versa, yes. how do you get over that? Because you get stuck in that web, and then uh, more so with this one with a, a woman, they're jaded, and then they think every guy's going to cheat on them and lie to them with a man. They compare every woman, whether they want to admit it or not. In my opinion. Right. They compare every woman to that woman that they messed up with and are constantly thinking, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that, whatever. And then that's got to kill the happiness. How do yes, you do? Yes. How do you break out of that cloak? This episode is brought to you by Fiji. More than just water. This is not just rock. It's ancient volcanic rock that filters tropical rain, giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water. It's Fiji water. This episode is sponsored by Zbiotics. What is Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic? The Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is a genetically engineered probiotic you drink before drinking alcohol to avoid that rough next morning and get back to living your life. PhD scientists invented it because they know the real problem is not dehydration. It's a toxic byproduct of alcohol. And Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the only product that breaks it down. Just remember to drink responsibly and plenty of rest too. Every time I have Zbiotics before drinking, I'm amazed at how good I feel the next day. Zbiotics is a must have for me because it means I'm still going to make my daily workout even if I have a few drinks the night before. That's important to me. You can get Zbiotics for 15% off your first order using my code MSCS Media Checkout. I recommend getting the six pack. That's what I got. It's a great deal. You have a couple extra to share with friends. Go to zbiotics.com backslash MSCS Media. That's Z as in zebra, biotics, B I O T I C S dot com backslash MSCS Media, or scan the QR code on the screen right now and get 15% off your first order. Yeah, so here I'm going to throw, throw at you some uh, evolutionary psychology knowledge from my scientific uh, career. Uh, it turns out that the likelihood of a relationship ending if a man cheats on a wife versus if a woman cheats uh, on, on his partner is, is very <laughs> asymmetric. If a woman cheats on a man, it almost guarantees the dissolution of the marriage. It's about 90%. If a, a man cheats on a woman, it's only about 30%. So there's a three time, threefold greater likelihood of the relationship ending if the woman cheats on a man. Now, if you're some idiot who takes women's studies courses at Oberlin College, then you you argue that that's due to the patriarchy. It's the double standard of patriarchy. Oh, well, geez. no. The reason why that asymmetry exists, and not not condoning it nor justifying it, just explaining it, is because the evolutionary threat of a woman cheating on a man looms much, much larger genetically than the other way around because humans are a biparental species, right? Uh, human males are actually super dads in the animal kingdom. We may not we may not invest as much, as much as women do in the human context, but we are still super dads. We are officially a biparental species. So it doesn't make sense for your ancestors and mine to have not cared if their women go around with 73 guys because then I don't know if the if the kid that I'm going to invest in for the next 18 years until he reaches his reproductive maturity whether he's mine or he's the sexy gardener who comes from uh, Corfu right yeah. therefore it, it makes evolutionary sense yeah. for us to have evolved the emotional the cognitive the behavioral system that makes it makes us very intolerant of cuckoldry, of a woman cheating on us. So right off the bat, there is a distinct asymmetry in terms of how likely it is to be a fatal reality if one cheats or the other. But the more important question might be to ask the following, should you cheat or not? Or can you reduce 
life is a trade-off, right? Uh, I'm not the ugliest guy in the world. I have, you know, pretty high status. There are, there's a long line of, forgive me, I'm not trying to be immodest. I'm trying to make a point. I can have a long oh, line of possible women who I could easily get, yet I willfully choose not to because two things. To violate the sanctity of what I have with my wife would not allow me to do that. And whatever I stand to lose, however small the probability might be that she leaves me or doesn't leave me, is not worth me pursuing those otherwise very natural urges. So it's not as though I don't see tons of women and go, oh my goodness, is she beautiful, right? Oh my goodness, can my mind go? So there is nothing unnatural or immoral for me having you know, responded to that stimulus. What makes me hopefully better than the next guy is that I weigh the pros and cons. I also have, not only do I have the Darwinian instinct to want to mate with many women, but I also have the Darwinian moral compass that allows me to put a stop on that instinct, right? We, we all have a desire to eat as much fatty foods as we can, but if you do that repetitively, you end up like God said was at 256 pounds. <laughs> but had I not done that, had I used another set of instincts to hone that in, then I wouldn't have had to lose 86 pounds. So life is trade-offs. It's perfectly understandable. Look, we are a, and I actually talk about this in the in the forthcoming book. I have a chapter on variety as the spice of life. And then the chapter title has sometimes in bracket. In, <laughs> sometimes. In, 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 right? <laughs> Why am I saying sometimes? Because wow. for some domains, it makes perfect sense to yeah. seek variety. If you're in a monogamous marriage, well, it may not be a good idea to seek uh, sexual variety, even though... We all have that urge, and including, of course, women. Amen. Can I maybe just share with you some sure. very strong scientific evidence that suggests that women are hardly these prudish little saints that we'd like to think they are? Please, Please do. do. Please do. Get ready. Number one, women are much more likely to cheat when they are in the maximally fertile phase of their ovulatory cycle, meaning that their desire to shop for other genes, I mean, literally shop for other genes, increase when they are most likely to be impregnated by another man, mm. number one. Number two, women, if they cheat on their long-term partner, they're more likely than not to cheat with someone who is of superior genetic stock. So I may, I'm speaking now as a woman, I may marry Bill Gates, but I cheat with the really hot uh, gardener who's got the Olympic swimmer's body. So the ideal strategy for me is to convince geeky Bill Gates that, no, no, the child really looks like you, even though he's a spitting <laughs> image of Rico, the Greek gardener. Right. No, 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 it's, no, it's, it's sure not I'm laughing, true. But it's true. <laughs> right. So okay. So that's number two. Number three, uh, Robin. B and by the way, all this stuff is in the forthcoming book. So if you like this stuff, July, you know, okay. July, you gotta have a talk. You gotta have a July, talk. Exactly. July is a little bit too long, man. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not giving too much stuff that they won't want to buy the book. But hopefully, I'm just titillating their curiosity. Uh, this is from Robin Baker, who wrote a great book. I think it was 1996 called Sperm Wars. Uh, and I actually tried to get Robin Baker to come on my show. We know each other from you know scientific circles and so on. Uh, but he retired. He's he's probably now in his late seventies, early eighties. So he wrote back to me very sweetly, said, "Hell, you know, I would have loved to have a conversation, but I'm out of the whole thing." So he never came. Anyways, you can check out his book. It's uh, Robin Baker's Sperm Wars. In that book, he talks about the fact that there are actually phenotypically there are three types of spermatozoa that men produce. So we typically think of the the fertilizing sperm, right? There is there is the sort of the genetic DNA head, and then there is the the vigorous tail, and then there's 250 million spermatozoa in one ejaculation. They're all fighting to get to that proverbial promised land, the egg, to fertilize it. And one out of 250 million will win that genetic lottery. Okay. 
But it turns out, according to Robin Baker, that that's not true, that there are two other types of, if you like, uh, forms of sperm in a man's ejaculate. One is called blocker. The other one is called killer. The blocker spermatozoa just stands, if you'd like, at the entrance of the reproductive tract of women, blocking the possibility of entrance of another man's sperm. And killer spermatozoa don't look for the egg to fertilize, but rather they are looking for other men's sperm to kill. Now, let me close the loop on this. Sperm is is viable within a woman's reproductive tract for roughly 72 hours. So for a man to have evolved the chemical weaponry to have not only fertilizer sperm, the traditional sperm that you know of, but to have killer sperm looking for another man's sperm to kill and blocker sperm stopping another man's sperm from coming into the reproductive tract, that means that evolutionarily speaking, the likelihood that your female ancestors and mine would have very much slept with multiple men within a 72 hour period. Okay, so that's, that's <clears throat> should hopefully blow the mind of a lot of yeah. men that are listening. <clears throat> yeah. First off, those two guys, those two sperm guys are assholes and, <laughs> you know, and second off, I, I get it through, ev through evolution that that the body just adapted and and created that right like as we exactly. evolved yeah and so exactly to what you just asked it is That's female promiscuity that shapes male physiology now let me let me unpack that for you so this is another piece of evidence that i discuss in the in the forthcoming book so if you look at the size of a primate's testes testicles across different primates okay so let's look at a few let's look at extremes mountain gorilla silverback gorilla the males are majestic they're this gorgeous like hulk superman 400 pounds but probably 10 to 20 times stronger than any the strongest man alive very very small testicles gentlemen why because their mating system is called it, the official fancy scientific term is polygynous. Polygynous means one male with multiple females, meaning the dominant male banishes all of the other males. He has a harem and he controls the sexual access to many, many females. Therefore, the mating system within mountain gorillas does is not conducive to sperm wars because it is very likely that the females are only being inseminated by a single male, even though some of them will go and cheat with, with another one. Now, let's take the other extreme, and then I'll link it to humans in a second. Chimpanzees are walking testicles, okay? Chimpanzees are massive balls. So what do you expect the females in that species? They're having sex left and right. Left and right. We have a fight, we have sex. We say hello, we have sex. We're in disagreement, we have sex. And not sex with one, sex everywhere. Therefore, men's or males' physiology and anatomy, in this case, the size of the testicles, are an adaptation, are an evolutionary adaptation to female promiscuity within that species. The more the female is promiscuous, the bigger the testicles of the males of that species. So now, gentlemen, we come to what all of your millions of viewers and listeners want to know. So what about the balls of human beings? <laughs> are we on the mountain gorilla side or are we on the chimpanzee side? Do you want to take any guesses which side we're more on? I'm going to say the mountain gorilla side. Yeah, that's my okay, guess. Okay, well, you're being a unrealistic optimist, so that tells you that your answer is wrong. We are actually closer to chimps in the sense that our, our testicles are not nearly as big. I mean, by the way, it's adjusted for, for body size, right? Uh, so what does that mean? That means that if female promiscuity is the mechanism that leads to the adaptation of male testicles, and since human males have larger testicles on average when you map all primates, 
that means our human females, your female ancestors and mine, were getting busy in the bushes with a few guys. So you put all that together and it shows you that both men and women have a desire for variety seeking, but we also have the desire for long-term coupling because we have to evolve the romantic love for us to stay together long enough to raise those children until they're 18. So it's perfectly normal and natural to desire other people, but depending on who you are, you either instantiate that Darwinian instinct or you say, you know what? I'm not going to violate the sanctity of my marriage and I'm going to keep it in my pants. And so that's, so to answer your question in a very long winded way, no, rather than succumbing to the temptation and then regretting it, why don't you think about possibly if you've got a good marriage, you know, keeping it in the pants and hopefully you can grow old and happy together. Real quick, doctor, uh, <clears throat> on that point. So nowadays, social media, TV, I mean, you're getting nonstop stuff thrown your way, right? Compared to, say, 20 years ago. And not that people didn't cheat 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. But now it's like, it seems like it's rampant because... You know, you look at a let's say a woman looking at a guy and she looks over her husband like, man, he used to be ripped and chiseled. And then she's on her phone and it's like this chiseled guy comes up and it's like because the phone probably heard her say that. So now it brings up a chiseled guy. So she's like, well, he's worthless. So let me go. So with time, I'm saying, do you think it's gotten worse? And how do you (laughs) I guess you just turn the phone off and turn the TV off. Right. You don't look at it. But. (laughs) It's so much information that's being thrown. And and I think that's why a lot of times divorces are higher. And, you know, you could probably speak for that. But yeah, well, by by the way, I've I've done research that speaks to your point where I mean, scientific research where I looked at things like, you know, how much information do men and women look at before they decide to commit to a mate? So, for example, uh, let's say there are up to 25 attributes that I can look at. So I could look at how intelligent she is. I could look at how beautiful she is, how caring she is. So there's how much income she makes, whatever, right? So if I were to present you with a task where I'd like you to open up as much of this information as possible, and then you decide, so you could look at as little as one attribute up to 25 attributes. How many will you look at before you stop and either say, this person is a dud. I don't want to go out with them. Or you stop and say, I will, I choose this one. Well, it turns out, as is perfectly explainable from evolutionary psychology, that women, when it comes to rejection behavior, right? In other words, how much information do I need to look at before I reject a bunch of suitors? Women arrive at that decision much more quickly than men. In other words, yeah. it takes a lot less convincing to convince women that a bunch of guys are losers than the other way around. I mean, for for a guy to be convinced to not mate with a woman, she has to have tails and horns before he says no, right? <laughs> yeah, Whereas it true. takes... Now, now, the answer, the, the evolutionary reason for that is very simple. Women are sexually more choosy because the minimal obligatory parental investment that they have to provide if they become pregnant is a lot larger than men. In other words, the, the cost of making a poor mate choice looms much larger for women than it does for men. So it makes sense that they would be choosier. On the other hand, when it comes to choosing decisions, like in other words, how much information do I look at before I stop and choose a mate, then women search for more information before they commit. So they they use less information to reject partners, but they use more information to choose partners. Now, why is that related to what you're asking? Because what you're saying is, the contemporary world, instead of it being 25 attributes, now we can go on our app and look at 75,000 suitors rather than, you know, the seven guys that were in our village when we were mm-hmm. in our evolutionary past. Uh, that's what, by the way, makes hookup culture so alluring to so many people, right? Certainly young people. I mean, I was I was already married when all the, the Tinder and all that stuff was happening, so... I never, quote, benefited from the hookup culture in that sense. But now, many, many, both men and women will speak exactly to your question, which is, how am I supposed to be with one person 
when I can get on Tinder whenever I'm feeling in the mood and I can get the whole <laughs> buffet of super sexy guys or super sexy girls and so on. It's a struggle. But again, life is about trade-offs. I wouldn't trade all the beautiful women in the world for my wife. That doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the fact that there are tons of women that I would love to be with. But you know how uh, I forget what bird it is, and, and even even the monkey, you know, the alpha monkey, he'll run around and everybody stands and he'll break trees to keep his spot to stay the alpha, so we can basically keep the woman. There's that one bird that will spend. I wish I could remember the name. I'm sure you know. This bird will spend hours flapping its feathers like this peacock uh no it's not a peacock but it, there'll be like five of them and whichever maybe a hundred of them and whichever one can do its dance the best is the one that's going to get lucky that day and that would relate to your superior right and yeah, these so, birds i mean they got to be in shape to do this shit. Oh, yeah so i'm gonna break it down for you scientifically tommy and actually it's in this book right here and in this book right here. So The Evolutionary yeah, Basis of Consumption, which is a scientific book, and then The Consuming Instinct, which is a book meant for the masses. What you just described is what's called lecking behavior. Lek, a, a lek, L-E-K, is a physical space where typically birds, usually male birds, will enter the lek, will engage in some sort of sexual signal. It could be ruffling of the feathers. It could be a, a, a oh, kind of a yeah. vocal thing, right? So and what happens is all the females stand at the periphery of the lek as an audience, and then they choose who is the best one. Now, there's a, there are many, many examples of lecking behavior, especially with bird species. One of the most beautiful ones is there is a red-capped mannequin uh, in Central America that... His lecking behavior is a moonwalk, a dance. I mean, I'm telling you, Michael Jackson should be paying royalties to this bird uh, yeah. because if you if you watch and you can you can check it on Google later, uh, he does. You actually have to slow, you have to slow it to one five hundredth of the speed for the human eye to be able to pick up the kind of move he does wow. and then the females are sitting around in the tree and then they pick okay this is the top dancer this is the guy that's got the genetic stuff that i'm looking for now why why does your question resonate with me so much is because that describes by the way 30 years of my scientific career because what i've done in my scientific career is take these evolutionary principles that we typically see in other animals and I argue that consumer behavior, for those of you who don't know, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, but also a consumer psychologist. So I apply evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study consumer behavior. So I argue that many of the consumer choices that we make are nothing but these types of liking behavior. So exactly. example, one of the one of the scientific papers that that received the most attention that I published was a paper in 2009 that I uh, authored with one of my former graduate students where we looked at what happens to men's testosterone levels when they engage in a act of conspicuous consumption, driving a fancy car, right? So the Porsche or the Maserati or the Ferrari is akin to the peacock's tail in the yeah. human context, right? So what we did basically is we brought young men we rented a Porsche. Now imagine, try, I always joke and I tell people, imagine trying to go to a scientific agency <laughs> asking for that's money. Funding. <laughs> funding for a Porsche. So that you can rent a Porsche. <laughs> and, and you're saying, I swear it's for science, guys. It's for science. I, I so, agree with you 100%. So we rented a Porsche. We got a beaten up old car and we, and when, when each man would come to our experiment, this wasn't the psychology experiments, imagine if you were driving. No, we actually oh, made them drive the two cars. They drove the, the, the shitty car, they drove the fancy Porsche, and they did it in two environments. So to your point about the birds, remember I was talking about Lex? Yeah. So they, they drove the two cars either in a non-Lex or in a Lex. Now, what does that mean in the human context? Non-Lex, 
you drive it on a semi-deserted highway where nobody sees you. Alec is in downtown Montreal. There is a street called Crescent Street where all of the male imbeciles drive around all night with the music blasting. Look at me. Look at my peacock tail. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So we had the men drive these two cars in those two mm. environments. Now, what was the dependent variable that we measured, guys? Testosterone mm. levels. How did we measure it? We measured it using salivary assays where we could then measure testosterone. And what do you think happened when you put young men in the Porsche, exactly as you just went like this, their testosterone levels explode. It's like they've been doping for the Tour de France for the past six years, yep. right? Why? Because you are imbuing me. I'm speaking now as one of the subjects. You are imbuing me with immediate high social status. Now, we know from the animal kingdom, okay. when yeah. two rivals fight, the winner sees a rise in testosterone. The loser sees a drop in testosterone. So I said, hey, let me test this idea to show that consumers are nothing but wealthy animals. Yeah. And that's exactly what I thought. So my whole career has Amazing. been nothing but taking biological principles and demonstrating that when we put on our consumer decision-making hat, we're not far from being animals ourselves. That's amazing. Believe it or not, I know I don't look it, but I read NCBI all the time, all the independent case studies, all of it. I'm so cool. into it. That's why I asked you about the birds, because I think it relates to today. And that was a great study that you did. And I, you. And I had a Lamborghini. I mean, I'm not a bad-looking guy, but let me tell you, when I had a Lamborghini and a Bentley, I, I could take my pick. And nowadays, you know, oh, your, your testosterone's low. Here, take testosterone. Blah, 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 blah. When we can find in case studies, real actual case studies, not done by Pfizer and jerk-offs like them, ones like you did, that if you put a man in a car like you just said, I know I'm repeating it, their testosterone goes up. Oh, okay? Yeah. So... A lot of times I think, and I, and I've, and I talked to him about this. I see these guys, uh, I know a lot about this. I see these guys go into the HRT clinics and the TRT clinics, and I don't know what they're doing over there, but my head's blown off because they will give them testosterone for no reason. They don't give them any anti-estrogen. Why? So they come back and get more and pay more, right? You know, you know that. Obviously, sure. why? Who? What doctor in the right mind would give somebody, you know, sipinate or ethanate, and not give them some type of anti-estrogen? Why? Because when you come off of it, you're going to feel like shit, so you go back to get more. Exactly. But in case studies that were actually done, like yours, just because it says 300 doesn't mean that they need to go shoot test in their ass every week. It could be lifestyle change, drive, so on and so forth. Of course. I said, that was a great study. Uh, yeah. By the way, to your point about you owning and uh, you know all those fancy cars, uh, did one of them. my what? <laughs> one of my brothers of uh, in California. Uh, I have three siblings, uh, all of whom are much older than me. They so they're ten, twelve, and thirteen years older than me. Uh, the the one who's closest in age, who's the guy who's ten years older than me, uh, was a very very, very wealthy and successful dot-com guy uh, from about the mid-80s to roughly the mid-90s. He he amassed a gigantic fortune oh, in Southern gosh, California. Gosh. Yeah. And he so he, he owned three Ferraris. He owned an Aston Martin Lagunda, for those of you who may, may not know what that is. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, all kinds of other, you know, peacocking stuff. Uh, now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because there's a story in the book, which again, I'm, I'm hesitant. Don't say too say much. Yeah, 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 let it go. Let it go. Let it, just give it a tease. So there's a story in the book. Uh, well, that, there, there, I don't want to kill. I don't want to kill you and get you in trouble. But, you know, and then they're like, Thank no, you. you're not coming to Florida. Hell no. You're not talking <laughs> to him <Well>. again. <laughs> Let's just say this. He is a five foot four guy <laughs> on his best day, <laughs> but you're he though. walks oh. as though he's six foot four. Yeah. For two reasons. Number one, he's got unbelievable self-confidence. And number two, it really helps when you can pull out the chain, the chain key that has a Ferrari uh, on it 
and suddenly the girl is no longer uh, concerned about you being over six feet tall. So uh, having that kind of status and self-confidence is the, is the great equalizer. I won't mention a specific story that's super cool in the book that speaks to that. Uh, but to your point, maybe it's shallow, maybe it's just evolutionary. I think it's evolutionary. Women certainly do do i'm um, yeah i'm just being charitable yeah uh Char it, look uh i, I could, here's another study from from my work it's not published yet this is gonna this is not actually in the book so i'm gonna say it openly without hesitation that for uh, also though right yeah. isn't that awesome i like that uh so we did this so this is a study i did with one of my former doctoral students uh who's now himself a uh you know a, a senior professor shared professor uh we created these two versions of a personal ad like that you would find, let's say, in a dating app. And the only thing we manipulated, so there's a picture of the guy, there's all kinds of description about him, and the only thing that changed is, here is my favorite personal possession. And it was either some shitty red car or it was a spankingly beautiful new red Porsche. That's the only difference between the two experimental conditions. Now we asked men and women to evaluate this guy. Are you ready for this? <laughs> yeah. <You> ready? <laughs> yeah. Now we asked them. We asked them on many, many different traits. But I'm going to only mention one for the purposes of this conversation. How tall is that guy? I bet now, you he's six two, six one. Who, uh, no, but remember, I just said both men and women evaluate uh, him. So what do you think happens? Uh, me, men probably say he's shorter, like short, not, you know, whatever. And women are probably he's taller, or bigger. Perfect. See, yeah. the fact that you got that shows you that within all of us, is an evolutionary psychologist because we yeah. are Darwinian beings. We yeah. understand these. Now, you could take Professor Saad's course to learn all the fancy science, but instinctually, you knew the answer. And it's exactly right. You got it. M women, and so I call these two effects the status elongation and status contraction effects. The women look at the guy who was in the Porsche. Oh, he was tall. Why? Because height is a cue of status, one of several cues. You having that high status car correlates with that. So magically, even though objectively he didn't magically become taller, but my perceptual Perception. lenses mm -hmm. will make you taller. On the other hand, when you ask a man to evaluate, I am most intimidated not by a guy who's got prettier shoulders than me that does i don't i'm not intimidated by that but if you get a guy who's got higher status than me now i'm pissed off now that's triggering my my same sex rivalry juices therefore when i see that asshole with the porsche i need to derogate him i need to insult him so i put on my my perceptual lenses that are biased and what do i say Oh, he must be some short little puny guy with a small penis. That's why yeah. he's driving. I was just gonna say we we would <laughs> right? say we would say when we were growing up, you know, like the uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the trust fund kids that had to have the cars. We would call them pencil dicks. There you go. Yeah. So, so the psychology is and that's the beauty of evolutionary psychology because the exact same stimulus which objectively should not cause me to think you're taller or shorter just because you're standing next to a Porsche. Not only does it do that to me, but it does it in opposite directions, depending on whether it's the woman who's evaluating or the man. That's the beauty of evolutionary psychology. And isn't it funny that almost all evolution, when you look at animals, because I read about them all the time, it's almost with all of them, even sea, even in the sea. They're, 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 they'll do like... A lot of chameleons, and I'll get off this because maybe it's boring, but a lot of chameleons, it's like uh, the one that, that, that can be a chameleon the most. That's the one that's going to mate. You know, things like yeah. that. You know, it's just so cool when you see that. And then well, when you apply it like you had just said, uh, Professor, you know, I don't know how anybody can deny that, you know, there's no relation. I, I don't know. Well, so a couple, couple of points. Let me first mention the chameleon part. Then I'll talk about the, the denial of biology in a second. Uh, 
so in the parasitic mind in my last book this one the yellow that's one that's a good book I, thank you so much uh, i have a section that i call male feminists as sneaky fuckers now, <laughs> that's, does too. now that sounds as though i'm i'm being profane in my language but that's actually a sure. real zoological term and it comes from a study of a whole bunch of species some of which are actually in the sea others are not but many of them are in the sea where you have two types of males you have the traditional phenotype of a dominant male then there are these other small males who can't get the girls if they try to compete on those metrics so they pretend that they are females so that the dominant males lets them through and then they engage in surreptitious coupling in other words i yeah, have I to convince them. that right so then because i i knew about this phenomenon by the way the fancy term that i mean sneaky fuckers is one term the, <laughs> the even the fancier term is called kleptogamy is stealing mating opportunities right so i pretend that i am something to then get access to the girls so then that's when I had my light bulb. I, so th this phenomenon had been documented in the zoology literature back in the 1970s. My unique contribution was to argue that male feminists, the, the super sensitive woke feminists, wow, wow, wow. are actually engaging in kleptogamy, right? Yeah. Look how empathetic I am. Look how gentle I am. I hug the trees. I really care about the refugees. Now, maybe you could give me a shot at having sex with you. And so there is real power, if you want to understand human behavior, to look at all of our animal cousins, because that then says a lot about why we do the things that we do. So, okay, so that's one. Number two, about your biology denial. My whole career, my scientific career, has been defined by the fact that most of my breathtakingly imbecilic colleagues reject the idea that biology matters in explaining human behavior in general and consumer behavior in particular. So most social scientists, it, it may or may not surprise you, actually till today, if your children go to college, they will learn that what makes humans different different from all other animals is that we transcend our biology. We are mm. a cultural animal. So evolution matters for the mosquito. Evolution matters for the dog and the zebra. But come on, professor, you, surely you don't mean that evolution matters for consumer behavior. Surely you don't mean that consumers are animals. Well, that's exactly what I mean, idiot. Yeah. You think that somehow <laughs> when, when we put on our, our consumer hats, we exist in a plane where our hormones don't matter, where our biology ceases to matter. But that's the, and by the way, that's how I originally realized that there was a problem in academia. So what eventually led me 25, 30 years down my academic career to write The Parasitic Mind was that I saw all of these profoundly imbecilic ideas being promulgated on university campuses and I would kind of look around and say, who who believes this bullshit? How, how could you believe that our hormones don't affect our economic decision making? I mean, what, I mean, I know for a fact that if I'm hungry or not, so if my blood sugar is up or down, it's going to affect the type of decision that I make. And yet economics as a discipline has evolved for a hundred years without ever mentioning the world biology in the study of economics. How could that be? You see what I'm saying? So that's how I first became aware that there was a war against reason on university campuses, which now has metamorphosed into every possible arena. May I make a comment on your previous book and then I'll get back to Please. the current because this one won't get you in trouble. So it, it just relates to it. Um, I don't know if you, you saw this one, but you, you know, uh, so like in with monkeys, the, if you notice the alpha always has the babies around or the teenagers around and they're picking bugs off of them. They're, 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 uh, cleaning them. And yeah. I, and I look at that as, as like, uh, they're getting them like as a human is getting ready in a suit and tie, ready to go 
to, you know, a, a big event where they want to look good and, and meet somebody, you know, or, or going out to a prom, whatever it may be. That's how I really look at it. And then also the relate, and this is where I, I, I think you got to be out of your mind not to agree with your biology. It's just stupid. So you had a, so there was a bunch of dogs and they were trying to get, they were, they were, there was a bunch of, there was a bunch of dogs and a bunch of monkeys and one of the dogs had killed one of the mom's babies. And the entire pack of monkeys tricked the dog. They literally hung out with the dog. They jumped the fence and, and like the, the farmer or whatever was like, oh, okay, they're getting along. But they were tricking the dog to thinking it's okay. They knew that the dog's babies were in the shed, whatever it was in. They tricked wow. this. They tricked this fucking dog for two, three weeks. I watched the whole thing, read about it, and then after three weeks, they got in, to and they didn't just kill him. They took the, They took him and threw the dogs off trees and threw every one of the babies because they killed one of their babies. Yeah. And then you take that biology and apply it to now, where if somebody kills a mother's baby, she might not go out and kill him because we have jail here. The monkey, you know, doesn't, but. I relate that the, to, the, to, the to your book. The sentiment is there. Yes. yes. The emotion yeah. is there. So I'll make a comment about both. So your first example with the grooming, this is actually called reciprocal grooming in the animal literature because, and I use it as an example of how reciprocity evolves in the human context, right? So let, let's say, Tommy, you and I are friends and you decide uh, to invite me for a fancy dinner for uh, my birthday. The expectation is that when it's your birthday, if we are good friends and I'm a decent guy, when it's your birthday, I will reciprocate and invite you when it's your birthday. Now, from a strict economic perspective, we could bypass this whole ritual because I'm going to pay a hundred bucks for you. You're going to pay a hundred bucks for me. We're going to end up at the same place. Let's skip the whole thing. The reason why we don't, gentlemen, is because those bonds, those rituals of reciprocity is what oils our our friendship it's the mechanism by which we're oiling that affection towards each other and that's why by the way if you invite me for my birthday and then i forget to reciprocate you will take offense to that you will mm -hmm. your feelings will be hurt and so reciprocal grooming by the way usually it's not one way so what happens is you know you give your back and the other one is picking all the parasites the expectation is that we then flip it and you do it to me Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The 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 example of uh, the monkey with the dogs that speaks to the evolution of our emotional system. Right. So for ex so I'll come back to the dog monkey story. There is a. Do you know the term Schadenfreude? Do you know what that means? No. Schadenfreude is a German word, which has entered now the you know the English language. It means to rejoice at the mishap of another so for example i'm driving my shitty car on the highway and this guy comes whizzing by in a ferrari speeding past me and driving recklessly you know with some hot girl so now i'm pissed like what, what an asshole this guy he's endangering everybody's life five miles down the road i see two cop cars that have pulled them over and yeah. now yeah right? so what do i feel <laughs> yes yeah. asshole yeah well so that emotional feeling mm -hmm. actually has a very clear evolutionary yeah. reason for why it evolved so when you are studying emotions or well, anything involving humans you have to always ask yourself why did the mechanism evolve to be of that form so now i'm going to come back to the dog versus uh monkey story that those monkeys have evolved the sentiment of revenge and retribution because because it makes evolutionary sense for you to evolve that because the most dangerous thing for most animals is usually when someone within your species does you wrong right and the only reason they typically don't do something wrong to you is because they know that if you've got a long memory you will do it back to them, right? So, you know, think about evolutionarily speaking, there are two tribes. I'd really like to get all the hot women of that other tribe so that they can become mine. The only problem is that there's a lot of 
nasty looking guys in that tribe that would not be very happy if I did that. They would remember it and then they're going to do it to me. And that keeps us, if you'd like, in check. So my point in saying all this is that what evolutionary psychology allows you to do is understand the ultimate explanation for a phenomenon. By ultimate, what we mean by ultimate is the Darwinian why. Why would that monkey have evolved that capacity to manipulate in order to seek revenge? Well, because there are evolutionary reasons why that makes Professor, sense. Professor, I mean, they tricked these dogs for three weeks. It's so interesting. I mean, tricked them, went and they, you know, petted them, played with it. Threw, they actually threw the bone to them. And next thing you know, all the all the dogs are going off trees, <laughs> throwing them off bridges and shit. I was like, but, you know, it's interesting because, I, and I was actually thinking of doing a sad truth, like a clip on my show about what I'm about to say, because it speaks to your question. So I'm reading currently a book on uh, uh, Stoicism by on Marcus Aurelius, uh, which is something that I, you know, I talk about the ancient Greeks in, in my forthcoming book and the sad truth about happiness. And so actually the guy who wrote that book is going to be on my show tomorrow. Tomorrow, His name is Donald Robertson. Oh, cool. And so the Stoics talk about, you know, uh, never getting insulted when someone defames, uh, defames you, you know, being able to respond properly. And from their vision, there is no reason for you to respond negatively and care about what other people say about you. And I question that advice. So yes, a lot of advice that the Stoics gave was spot on, but some of it I think was simply incorrect because it makes no sense for me to have evolved such magnanimity that anything that Tommy says, he can go on any show, defame me and lie about me, and I'm just going to go, hmm, mm. I'm never going to react. No. Why don't you go meditate? You, more... you can meditate. Meditate. Ah, exactly. Ah. It makes a lot more sense <laughs> for me to say, hey, Tommy, I'm from the Middle East. If you keep this up, your head's going to be a little mantle, in my... and then that keeps things in check. So, I think that this, the Stoics had a lot of depth and a lot of profundity, but the fact that they suggested certain courses of action that are contrary to evolutionary theory suggests that they may have needed to take a course in evolutionary psychology with Professor Saad. Now, uh, another question on that. So say you got married and you messed it up and now you're living in regret, going back to the regret thing. Oh, how, yes. how does one get over that? Because now, you, now you, you didn't go through the flags, or you did go through the flags, but you still made a mistake. How yes. do you get over that as a male or female so that you can move on when you're constantly in resent, wishing, so on and so forth? So I, I literally answered that exact question in the forthcoming book. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a hint uh, or, or uh, a teaser. If you wish to get in the good graces of someone that you've wronged, whether it be in the specific example that you gave, which is you cheated on your spouse, or whether it be you you lied to a, a friend, or whether you, you wronged a child, you have to be incredibly humble in your contriteness, and your apology has to be costly. What do I mean by that? It, let's suppose... So in biology, there is a concept of costly signaling. So please bear with me. It, it's it's yeah, very sure. powerful. So, so for example, why has the peacock's tail evolved to be so big, so vivid in coloring when yeah, it like actually that. reduces the likelihood of him surviving because it makes him more conspicuous to predators? It makes it more difficult for him to oh. evade predators by having a big tail. Well, the reason why that tail evolves is precisely because it is a costly signal. What does that mean? It is basically saying, hey girls, despite the fact that I've got this big tail that reduces my survivability, the fact that I'm standing here and ruffling this big tail and I haven't died yet is proof that I'm really top genetic material. This is an honest signal of how good I am, so mate with me. So in other words, for a signal to be valuable, it has to be costly. Otherwise, it's useless. So let's put it in a human context before I come back to your question. There are many rites of passage across many different cultures 
where when men enter adulthood and they want to become warriors, they have to do this incredibly costly act of bravery. Otherwise, they have no chance of ever getting a girl in that tribe. If all it took is for me to do 10 sit-ups or 10 push-ups and then I get the girls, <laughs> then every single male could match that signal and then we would never know the pretenders from the real. But if you have to tie my ankles with vine ropes and jump off an 80-foot platform, as happens in the island of Vanuatu, where my head is about to splatter on the ground head first, that's an honest signal because it is truly <laughs> differentiating the the bullshit cowards from the really courageous courageous guys who are going to protect me if I have sex with you, right? Now, let's link it back to what you said. If you cheated on your wife and you expect that maybe a, a dinner and a bottle of wine and I am really sorry, I love you, is going to do it, it's not going to do it. You have to do whatever it takes for however long it takes, however costly the signal is, however amount of time you're going to be, uh, you know, uh, humiliated by her to get back into her good graces. And I actually quote a passage from a movie where they were intimating exactly that, where the guy had cheated on his wife to be and now was trying to apologize. And her father says to the, the guy who cheated, well, you keep doing it and keep doing it for as long as it takes and hopefully her defenses fall. So to answer, to summarize everything I said, the love is humble. So if you're too prideful so that you say, well, I apologize three times and she never accepted, so F her, then that means it's not going to work. But if you're willing to self-flagellate for however long it takes to get back into her good graces, then that's what you have to do. No matter how God long it damn. takes. No matter how this long it book, takes, right? No matter how long it takes. This book better get me a house in Southern California because the <laughs> amount of wisdom yeah. that I'm spitting in that book, it should not be 29 bucks. It should be like 290 bucks. I agree with you. Pull, pull up uh, tab two uh, where he looks, where I want to know what he eats, takes, and he's going to get in <laughs> trouble with his wife for uh, the next tab. Next now, now, yeah, these, oh. yeah, these are some of your reviews. You even got Megan Kelly, and she is not easy to get a review from there, pal. So, uh, congratulations oh, on that. Thank you. So, I got Megan Kelly, you got Jordan Peterson. Who else you got here? You got uh, Drew Jordan Pins Peterson, Drew Pinsky. Yeah, uh, you've got Aaron Curiarty, who's a psychiatrist yeah. uh, from UC Irvine. Uh, who else do I have? I've got a whole bunch of oh, I've got a historian who wrote a book on happiness a history in other words he does a historical analysis of the concept of happiness spanning many cultures and many thousands of years uh who else i've got a whole bunch. i got i think i got seven or eight really top people but yeah you pointed to some of the more famous ones pinsky peterson and kelly absolutely yeah everybody knows uh peter but uh kelly you know she's tough she she's she's tough so you know for her i gotta to tell you it, megan yeah. kelly megan kelly Maybe I'll get into trouble for this. If 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 one were to get a hall pass, as they say, <laughs> Megan Kelly is the Megan yeah. Kelly is the ultimate woman. But you know why? Because number one, I mean, she's a honey badger. She takes yeah. right, but she's not a honey badger while sacrificing her femininity, right? Which basically proves that you could be a very tough alpha female, yeah, and yet still, you know breathtakingly beautiful and feminine so beautiful she's got it all megan right. kelly is the full package that that's why i was i pulled that up uh because even whether you like her don't like her everyone knows she's she's an alpha female Speak, uh, speaking of hall passes though who would my hall pass would be jennifer aniston jennifer anderson jennifer yeah. aniston's my hall pass no <sighs> you know what i'm i'm going to have to very respectfully, but staunchly disagree with that hall pass. No, voice. you don't like that one. I, I don't know. It's something about you know. I, well, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I always. I mean, I I say it in a joking, humorous way, but I actually mean it. I say that I turn into a catatonic state if I see two television shows come on my TV. Friends, <laughs> Friends. Friends. <laughs> And yeah. Big Bang Theory. Those two shows are crimes against human dignity. So. To the extent that Jennifer Aniston is in 
some way, obviously associated with friends. Oh, gotcha. I, I don't see her as a as a sexual being. I see her as a, a stroke waiting to happen. Oh, gotcha. If I watched that show, I I think my whole past before she got with uh, Pete or whoever she's with now, May, is her name Megan Fox? She was in. Oh, uh, Megan Fox. Megan Fox. I I might take in her prime. He's I, the one that with the blue eyes. Yeah, the blue killer yeah. eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's she's nice. Maybe a bit, if I, I may offer, th maybe a bit plastic. Yeah. yeah. Like, That's why I mean in her prime before she got yeah. a little bit too, maybe like a decade ago. Not not right yeah. now where she's real prostic, we'll say, to be nice. You know? Exactly, exactly. So she, so I, Megan says, says about the book, no one is better at helping us laugh, like you said. You know, that, that's just so great. At the madness of today's modern world, which we all know is a mess, then my dear friend, podcaster, and therapist to us all, Dr. Gaz said, his new book, The Sad Truth About Happiness, reveals the secrets behind the optimistic approach to life and shows us how we can be happier to people. And for her to what? say that, I will say it five more times. Yeah. you. I don't think you could pay her off, Doc. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 there was there was no exchange of money. I just uh, made the request, and she was very gracious. She said she'd love to do it, she, and she did it on time. She's just lovely. Uh, that's and by the way, that's that's the magic of life, right? Which is these new connections that we make. I mean, look, if we didn't have this medium, maybe you, myself, and you guys would have never met. No. If I did not, if I weren't a professor who wanted to get out of the stay in your lane attitude, if I only did my scientific work, only talked to other professors in the ivory tower, I would have never had the pleasure of getting to know Megan Kelly and tons of other people that I've gotten to know that otherwise our worlds would have never intersected. So that's actually something else that I talk in the book. I have a whole chapter on, so the, the chapter is titled life as a playground, right? Oh. Meaning you know, live your life as though you're consistently at play, right? You see it in the conversation we're having today, if if I can speak of myself, right? I'm sure. I'm excited, I'm happy, I'm I'm happy to talk. There's no pretense, there's no arrogance, it's just fun. fun. Right? You're, yeah. you're you're getting people to hopefully enjoy the ideas that are floating around in your brain. What could be more exciting and fun? Even when I do scientific research, which you know is obviously a serious endeavor. For me, it's a form of intellectual play, right? I mean, what is science other than just solving a puzzle, right? So we can go and buy at the at the dollar store a puzzle, right? You know, when you make the the puzzles with a with a thousand pieces. I hate well, puzzles. Is, I love puzzles. I hate puzzles. Oh. But I but I do but I do like looking on our microscope. Believe it or not, I do like looking on our microscope and seeing how cells mutate and spike proteins. Pull that back up because I want to know who dressed you. Who dressed you? Who picked the font? Because whoever did that, look at this guy. This you, guy oh, has an eight. This no, I'm not being. I, I'm being honest. I mean, you're very sweet. You want to? You want to? Got the blue he, shirt. He, look at you, buddy, with the blue text. Here's with the blue you ready eyes. For this? You look, ready for this? Yeah. I'm giving you now backdoor information. <laughs> Who's, the photo, Who's the connection? Who's the connection? So, so, so that photo. That photo shoot happened as I was coming out on a, the tail end of the worst gastro virus for over a week. Okay. So about two about two hours before I went for this photo shoot that you so kindly complimented, I called the the photographer and I said, I I don't think I can make it. He said, well, what do you mean you can't make it? We've got the studio. We've got the makeup person. We've got the photographers. We've got everybody. I said, okay, well, does your does your studio have a bathroom if I need it? <laughs> he says, yes, yes, we're covered. So luckily, I didn't have to go to the bathroom because, as I said, I was on the tail end of it. But uh, just to say that I'm pretty happy that it came out the way that I did, given the week that had transpired before that photo was taken. I'm telling you, Doc, you're yeah. going to get in trouble on this one. When this is on the bookshelves and Barnes and Nobles, oh boy, you're gonna be in trouble. You you better have oh some flowers God. ready when, when when you're peeling them off here. You know, we just but, talked about the Ferrari. <laughs> you know what, my wife? I, I don't know if you've ever seen me do this on on social media. Whenever my wife gives me some sort of uh, food that is kind of a fattening food, 
I always sure. call it her mate guarding strategy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if I start looking yeah. as though I'm too cut up and too svelte, oh, here come the cannolis. Oh, here come the cannolis. Here comes the uh, there, hand. She's going to be cooking gravy for you where you can smell it a mile away. Or, or uh, you know, I forget what uh, down uh, Lebanese. It's kind of the same stuff, but oh boy, you're gonna have extra salt on everything. <laughs> but is that is that even though know, we're joking about it? Is that kind of true that 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 true. you know if if a, if a male maybe the opposite way too, but I think more on the male side, if a male's looking too good, that the wife will be like, I I can't have him looking this good. Is there some truth to that though? Oh, of course, of course, right? We both men and women use all sorts of territorial strategies to protect what's there. So of course there's tons of literature on that. Now, I'm not sure whether when she cooks an amazing fatty meal, she's literally saying, sure. let me fatten up the pretty boy so that other girls don't look at him. But maybe subconsciously she is, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I say yeah. it somewhat jokingly, but certainly the the instinct to try to find strategies to make your, your partner a bit uglier is, I mean, that's, I mean, isn't that why men usually get jealous when their wives go out in a super revealing dress and you say, really, you're going out with that? I mean, that's exactly the same thing, right? Yeah, I, I, I say you're going... I probably shouldn't say this, but I, <laughs> I, I... Well, who cares? I say, sometimes I, I would say, you know you're dressed like girls I used to have on rotation? You're walking out on my rotation list. <laughs> like, you're, like, you know, you look exactly... Well, this is the top-selling shirt. Okay, well... Top selling shirt to the hookers, maybe. You know, uh -oh. <laughs> you know. Uh -oh. oh, how shit. long have you been married, uh -oh. Tommy? Uh, well, uh, the first time, seventeen years, and I've been engaged four on this one. Okay, and, and so it, the 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 story that you just said is with this one or the other one? Uh, with this one that's hooked on this generation with this crazy social media and then fucking TikTok and uh, I, I, could, I I might soften my language if I could offer some unsolicited feedback. Sorry. Go ahead, yeah. No, no, not with me. Oh, you, uh, yeah. I don't mean with me. I mean with the with the spouse to be. I'll, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what what's the feedback? No, the feedback is I might soften some of the. the oh, soften! The oh, soften! Yeah. Well, here we go with that. Like we like we were talking about earlier, the authenticness. <laughs> yeah. And I don't. That's true. Because I don't you're mean right. it like you're a whore. I just mean it like, have you looked in the mirror? But, but, but these days they don't look at, they, they just think it's, it, it's okay. Uh, can you pull up a uh, tab four? Yeah. And I want to ask you again about your book, but I want to hit some things so you don't get killed. Uh, yeah, sure. you know, uh, and this next one. Hold on, I get, I move this. Yeah. Uh, so this is your website. Everything's here. Oh, this is fat God photo. Oh. Uh, this is your website. No, no, it? that's fine. That's oh. the one. I, I just have to remember to change the the photo. So this is. Oh, this is fat this, guy. Oh, I see. This is said. this is probably. I'm gonna go, two fifteen to twenty five in this photo. Oh. Wow. Well, even oh. more to your point. There you go. And there and everything's there, right? Your YouTube, your podcast. Yeah. So this is my website exactly. So if you want to follow me, if you want to subscribe to my podcast, to my YouTube channel, whatever it is. Go to this one-stop shop website, and you've got it all. Got it all there. For the Twitter, the Spotify, everything. Instagram, LinkedIn. Everything. And we'll have all that in the description, of course. Anything I could do to help you. A anything. Uh, Thank I, you so much. You're, you're really, so much fun. Yeah, and, that, uh, this as, is fun. Yeah. As I said, consider yourself envy. Palm Beach. You know, I'm not a Florida guy. I'm very much a Southern California guy. I lived in Southern California I was a professor at University of California, Irvine, for a while. My brother, the one with the Ferraris, has been in California since 84, so it's like a second home to me. But recently, we started you know, going to Florida more often. So it's only recently that I discovered Palm Beach. I've been there a couple of times. You know what? It's calling me. It's I'm, I'm still not willing to say it's as beautiful as... Newport Beach. Wheel them in. Oh, I know Newport Beach. I know I used oh, to have uh, season tickets at the Lakers and I, I would go try to see Kobe because Kobe lived in Newport Beach. That's right. Yeah. Actually, where he lived, which is in Newport Coast, Coast, was very close to where we, we used to live. And so it's very, very hard to compare, you know, the weather and the topography, the mountains of Southern California. 
I think just in terms of its nature, it's more beautiful. But I'm coming around. I'm starting to love Florida. So maybe God willing. When you fly in, I'll take you for a trip around Palm Beach Island. Yep. That's Ooh. your spot. It's called Palm Beach Island. Like uh, the studios here, maybe about a mile and a half down. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this is a funny story, quick, just to laugh off, off the subject. Uh, Pacino's got a house down the street. Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester wow. Stallone. Now, the, the lawn care has to, you know, because you're in Palm Beach Island, so, you know, the lawn care has got to be 20K a month, and no one's ever there. And these are mansions. <laughs> I, I mean, the whole road is mansions. Best places to eat. You can just walk around with your wife and look at the water and the ocean. The only thing I will give you is you don't have the cool mountains and everything else. But you, you forget one thing. What? The taxes. The fu- yeah, how yeah, about that's the taxes? What you that's, don't want. Yeah. that's why there you go, come buddy. Here. After this right book. There. The taxes. You better move before 100- July 25th. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. And by the way, that the taxes on this one destroyed me. I mean, I always say that the taxes that I paid on this book might have been more traumatizing than going through the Lebanese Civil War that I went through. I mean, I mean, I, I'm 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 almost being literal. I That's know. how soul crushing it was. I know. Now, uh, you got to get down to Palm Beach Island. That will soak you in. I'm telling you, Thank well, you, right? Because yeah. you, you could walk on the the dock and. It's just there, and it's just different. It's not like Boca and West Palm and Fort Lauderdale. Like, you couldn't pay me to live in Fort Lauderdale. You couldn't pay for my house for me to live there. Exactly. Me personally, I like- It's cheesy. It's cheesy. It's cheesy. Miami, in and out. I do not want to live- I would go back to Philly if I wanted to do that. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, that that you noted in, in uh, your coming book. So, where I'm from- in Philadelphia and also him as well. If I go back, I haven't been there in 10 years. And my mother, who's Italian, and I know you can relate to this, she always thought, I'm not coming to Florida. It's too hot. It's too hot. It's too hot. And she was one of those ones that they're in their neighborhood with all their Italian people and they're not leaving. No matter what, they're not leaving. That's their area. Um, So if I were to go back, and I haven't been back in 10 years, but when I was back before, the same people are doing the same thing and they hate it and they get, uh, you know, two weeks vacation and that two weeks, they're either just drinking the whole two weeks or they're miserable from the other 54 uh, weeks that they worked. And you note this in your book. And then this goes back again to people telling them, oh, well, you should stay at this career because it's stable, but that's not really what they want to do. Then they're 80 and they're being, an, you know, they're painting. Maybe they're a great painter. Maybe whatever. Now, and that's part, that's one of your keys in in the book with the happiness, whereas, and I'm just putting it into my words, whereas who cares what somebody says? You do what you want, what's in your heart. Now, like you said, if the engineering firm was just failing after five years, I'm not going to keep dumping money into it. Okay, it was fun. It didn't work, but it did work. But people would look at me and be like, you're going to do an engineering firm? The, the reason doesn't matter why, but I said, yeah, I'm going to, you, you know, so on and so forth. So when you have someone like that and whether they want to admit, let's just say they're listening to us right now and they hate their fucking job. Let's just be, they fucking hate it. They don't want to be driving a forklift or whatever else they do up there. You know, they, they, maybe they like to play the guitar. Maybe they like to do whatever. How do you break them out of that? When all that influence is on them, all this, all that, this is, and I go back to the, this is how things are supposed to be or should be. And then really you're wiping a male or female's dream away and they stick living this nightmare job. And as you say, in the little snippets that we got from your book that you're holding till July 25th, (laughs) it's like extortion almost. You know, give him a racketeering charge and maybe we'll get out quicker. (laughs) But, uh, you know, having that said it you know if somebody's watching and you know they've been so brainwashed that no this is a great job but subconsciously they know they know that they hate what they're doing and that their true passion is to play the guitar or go dance or whatever it may be how what advice or or what one or two liners would you throw at them to just maybe get them out of that went now remember they yes. got the wife on them they got this on them they got the, and they'll get killed if they come on and say hey, i quit my job i'm gonna go make chairs 
but maybe they can make the best chair ever. So This podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch, has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra, Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart, or go to monsterenergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the beast. Monster Energy. I, yeah, so I, I, I don't know if I can answer in one or two sentences, but I can answer I was two, kidding. Two, quick, two quick related stories. Take your time. Uh, uh, story one. Uh, when I so this was probably 1996. It, it might have been my second or third year as a professor. I I joined my university in 1994 as a young professor. Uh, in the newspaper, the, the the university's newspaper. It's called the Thursday Report. There was a uh, an article, and it was written something like, "Finally, a doctor at 91, 91 or 92." And what that story tells that. is the following story. It's interesting. It's it's basically the story of a guy who uh, escaped Germany, Jewish guy, uh, during the rise. You know, as as the Nazis were slowly coming in, he had always been very interested in, in pursuing his educational career, but life circumstances didn't allow him to do that. He became a businessman, so he's. He's the Italian guys in in the neighborhood that you're talking about. Life took over. He had to do things. And then in his 60s, he was lucky enough that he could retire. And he said, hey, you know what? I'm still of sound mind and sound body. Why don't I just go and sign up for some evening classes, whatever. Some uh, This is b- bachelor's degree. So he's in his 60s. He's taking classes with 20 years old, 20 year olds. <laughs> so then he gets his bachelor's degree. Now he's in his 70s. He says, you know what? I'm still uh, feeling good. Why don't I go on and get my master's degree? Gets his master's degree. Now he's in his 80s, pursues his PhD, graduates with his doctorate at 91 or 92, and within a year of getting his PhD, he passes away. Now, did that guy uh, not have the same constraints that all the people that you're talking about have. Now, I don't mean now some some objectives are completely insane. I, I can't today say I want to be a starring ballerina, you know, right. at the Met Opera because I'm too old. I'm not flexible enough. I don't have enough talent. I, my back hurts. But there are many obstacles that we create in our head that it's only we are putting it there, right? I mean, what could be more impossible as an apparent dream than when you're in your 60s, you don't have any university education, and then by your 90s, you get your PhD. So that's number one. Story number two, very related. I had this guy on my show about a year ago. His name is uh, Memfred Steiner. He's a guy who uh, went to medical school and graduated in the 1950s because his parents had said, Come on, don't study in practical stuff. Get a real profession. Become a physician. So he became a physician. His love had always been physics. So he becomes a physician. Then he specializes, becomes a hematologist, a blood doctor. On the way in the 60s of getting his specialization, his medical degree, he picks up a PhD in biochemistry, has an entire career in medicine. And then after he retires, now he's in his 70s, He says, I want to pursue my original goal, which was to become a physicist. Now, he's already an MD, (laughs) a medical doctor, and a PhD, and he's not retired. He goes and starts taking undergraduate courses in physics at MIT. And then two years ago, two falls ago, he graduated with his PhD in physics at Brown University at the age of 89. Okay, So, (laughs) so the bottom line is, don't go after impossible bullshit dreams right. that you yeah. there's no way for you to materialize. But there are countless dreams that you are currently having in the deep recesses of your mind that the only reason why you're not doing them is because you've laid that obstacle, right? You don't have to get a PhD. You said you, you want to learn guitar classes? 
well, why don't you, instead of drinking beer, just go to your local community college and sign up for some guitar classes? The amount of happiness that that will, by the way, there is research that shows that just doing these kinds of things that give you purpose and meaning, and I don't mean purpose and meaning you're going to cure cancer or solve diabetes, but these little things that truly give you a sense of existential authenticity can make you less depressed, can make you less anxious, can give you a more optimistic look on life. So get rid of those obstacles, go out and do it. It's never ever too late <clears throat> but you speak of this and, and this is one of uh the pointers you know in the the pre thing what about the people around you how do you block out that noise when you want to go play the guitar or how about this Th this is a logical one say somebody's driving a forklift wife is happy because he's making his forty thousand a year with retirement and benefits but he wants to be a mechanic that's his dream is to be a mechanic but if he goes and be goes to be a mechanic, his wife is going to kill his ass and right. she'll, she won't stop the complaining and everything. So it's not always that the person doesn't want to do it or doesn't want to fill the dream. He doesn't want to have to deal with the noise. What do right. you do then? Well, OK, so of course, each case is different. So, of course, notwithstanding that you might have financial constraints. So, OK, so you can't become a mechanic and leave your union job that pays you well and gives you medical benefits how about you go to a mechanic uh you know adult training class every friday at your local high school in other words there are ways by which we can instantiate some of our most fundamental interests without necessarily doing a cataclysmic change i mean i understand that for many people they're locked into their lives right like i you know i am a welder and i've got pills to pay and I can't, it's not practical for me to suddenly become an artist, right? I get that. But how about you take an art class? How about you go to the local wine and, and the art seminar that just that will make you live a more authentic life, right? Inauthenticity is when my inner voice is not jiving with my outer reality. Well, close that gap. You can close it by doing something as drastic as quitting your welder job, but you don't have to do that. Just sign up to the local community college, take an art history course, and suddenly you'll feel satisfied. You won't be as angry. You won't be as depressed. Maybe your wife will even be happier because now it looks like you're not getting fatter on the couch. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wins. <clears throat> that, that That's a great... I, I was hoping you would answer that way because that's a way where they don't have to deal with the complaining, still do their dream, and maybe they become very good at the welding and they can come home and say, Hey honey, I, you know, I've got my degree. I have these three or four places that are willing to hire me without you cutting my nuts off. I'm going to put in my two weeks and go take this job and fulfill the happiness. And that would be a way that one could fulfill their inner self without getting killed at home. And Maybe. that would be one of the steps to happiness, right? Exactly right. Just live an authentic life. You don't have to bring down the entire edifice to do it. Just <laughs> do little things and hopefully your inner voice matches with the outer reality. And as I said, everybody wins. Be and, authentic. And then a tip without uh, your publishers killing you. How do you, now this is a big one. How do you keep the spice? Nope. After the honeymoon phase is go. over, right? You want to jump in on this one? And, and, and you've got, How do you keep that spice? And I, I heard you, I heard you not just on Rogan. I heard you on your own podcast. This, this guy says, he, <laughs> he says, yes. he says, I lose his 80, 87 pounds and I'm wearing her out or, or something oh, yeah, like yeah. that. I, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I said, no, I think I might've said something like, and now, you know, my, our lovemaking sessions used to be two hours long and now they're up to five hours long after losing 86 pounds. I think it was something like that. Something so like I, that. I, I, but I heard it on your podcast too. I was like, oh yeah, he's, he's feeling good. Uh, he's feeling good. You know, I, I think, look, it's, it's of course, spontaneity, yeah. right? So one of the ways by which we can maintain that desire for variety is, but we don't want to stray outside of our monogamous union is to incorporate variety, right? Like in other words, if, if what you do is we're gonna pencil it in every Saturday when the kids go out from nine to nine forty, and we're gonna do the things that we do using steps A, B, C, D, 
then that makes it easier for it to be monoton monotonous. But if we do it whereby it's an it's an afternoon where nobody is expecting it, let's put on the Barry White, let's bring out the fireman uh, uh, suit, uh, ca call me Rocco, and let's get it on. Well, sure, I'm not a different guy, but at least I've played the role for a moment. I've introduced variety. I've introduced spontaneity. So I think there's all kinds of ways. Now, but by the way, that doesn't mean that we should expect to have the same butterflies 25 years into a marriage as we did the first three times we had sex. That would be an unre... So when you see the books that promise you that, don't buy them because they're lying to you. That's never going to happen. But what we can do is we can delay that. But if we never put in the work, if we're never creative, if we're never spontaneous, if we're never playful, part of sex is playfulness, right? It's it's being fun. It's being irreverent. It's trying new things. And I don't think that that has an expiration date. We can do it when we're two months into our relationship. We could do it when we're 20 years into our relationship. I, I had a guy on my show who's a very serious, austere guy. His name is Charles Murray. I don't know if you know him. He's a political scientist who has written several you know, quite controversial books. Uh, I mean, they're not controversial to me, but they're controversial. For example, he talks about racial differences in in in, in uh, accomplishment and so on. So you're not supposed to talk about that and so on. And when he came on my show, course, I, I actually, I, I used this quote in, in the forthcoming book. He said something to the effect of, you know, the secret to finding the right spouse is to is to marry your best friend who you happen to be sexually attracted to. Yeah. And that, and I, I use that quote because that's that's exactly right, right? I, I prefer to be with my wife on a day-to-day -day basis more than with anybody else. In other words, I don't have guys, not that I don't go out with guy friends, but I don't have to institute a guy's night out. She doesn't have to institute a girl's night out because we need a break from each other because I genuinely enjoy her company. I can act like a buffoon with her. I can joke around. I can be serious. And, and I also have the benefit of finding her very beautiful and desirable. So if you can find someone that you're sexually attracted to, who's your best friend, you, you found the secret you to have the gold mine. And then yeah. you also uh, speak of <clears throat> how important uh, marriage is. And I, I don't know how it is over there, but here, hmm. whew, yeah, there's no support. this is what they do over here. Okay. <clears throat> over here means Florida? Uh, uh, like in the United States. Yeah, because okay. you're in Canada, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So here, what they do, and this is some sick. This is sick, and they really do it to the black community, which is even sicker. And I had uh, Jesse Peterson on, and he he went off about this. And what they do is they give women an incentive yeah. to get divorced and or leave the baby dad, and they do it yeah. to to not just. African Americans, they do it to white people too, but more so they target the African Americans, you know, voters and all that other bullshit. So nowadays, you know, when you talk about how important marriage is and so on and so forth, now the government is giving them incentive. For an example, prime example, it just happened like last week. Uh, my fiance, she doesn't need benefits, but whatever. If they're going to give them to her, I'll take them, right? So they. You know, they run out or whatever. And I say, don't worry about it. Just let it go. Let it go. I, I don't know if, if uh, your wife is like this, but she's Lebanese and doesn't let anything go. And on the phone forever, like fighting with these people, cursing them out. I mean, Jesus, three, four days of this. And I'm saying, just let it go. Anyway, that's that, that's one of your courses I need to take. To, <laughs> I need your therapy. <laughs> you know? So and what they said to her was, well, if you take Tommy for child support, Okay, we'll give you your full benefits, this, that, the other. And she's, and it's this whole thing. And they give the initiative for, to break up the family. And yeah. then here, I mean, the guy's got no shot. If the, if the woman's a full blown heroin addict and, you know, I don't know, has 37 million charges and the guy walks in and has a DUI, he's got no shot. The woman's getting it and she's getting paid. Paid, paid, you know, and if yep. you're married, they're going to get alimony if you didn't sign a prenup because of what is the thing that they use here? Like they're used to a certain. So say like a guy like you were here and you didn't need a prenup, you know, you love your wife, whatever. 
your wife that doesn't work and she's accustomed to lifestyle A, B, C, D, E. You go into court here and the alimony is based on that accustomed lifestyle that yeah, you yeah. provided for her because she didn't work. So it gives them this incentive to leave the man, break up the family, which is what we're seeing in mental health. I don't care what they want to blame it on. It starts with the family, in my opinion. Absolutely. And I, I well, I'm sorry. Yeah, to your, to your point, uh, I mean, what you just said about Jesse Peterson, whom uh, I've gotten to know, I, I've appeared on the show. He's a lovely guy. He's a good uh, guy. Larry he's a funny El guy. He's a funny guy. Larry Elder has argued for the same thing for, yeah. for many, many years and even more uh, lofty than Larry Elder, although Larry Elder is fantastic. Thomas Sowell, the famous black uh, economist, has railed against the father absence in the black family for many decades now. So rather than, you know, putting the blame for some of the problems in the inner city on, you know, systemic racism, the the, the boogeyman that doesn't exist, how about you fix the families and then many of these problems will, will go away. By the way, from, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, father absence not only explains things that you would think that you would think would that it would explain, you know, the likelihood of you becoming a criminal. How when do you quit school? Future trajectory of success is all negatively predicted by if the father's not there. But it turns out, gentlemen, this might blow your mind that the the onset of a girl's first menstrual cycle, the the fancy term is menarche. So the first time, the the timing of when a girl has her menses is highly correlated to whether there is a presence of a father or absence of a father in a home. And so hmm. here's how the mechanism works. If there is wow. no father in the home, the young girl goes into her reproductive window earlier. In other words, if the average age at which girls get their menstrual cycle is uh, 12, if the father is there, it's 10 if the father is not there. So not only does it have wow. great repercussion on, let's say, young men's future trajectories, it has a literal physiological you know, effect wow. on when your daughter will get her first menstrual cycle. And again, this goes back to something we talked about earlier, which is human beings are a biparental species. Both yeah. men and women are needed in the home for the f full flourishing of a child uh, and anybody who thinks otherwise is an imbecile we talk about that i mean I, I brought that up a million times on here right i keep saying like a kid needs a father and a mother and they serve two different purposes because a father is going to be the one hopefully that's like you know wait till your dad gets home right that's the famous saying wait right. till your father gets home that's that thing right. and then the mom's there to console and you know give the kisses but i think a lot of the problems we have in society now is there's the broken family system. A kid has no one, a father figure, if it's a boy to look up to, or maybe for the girl, a mother, and it just messes up the whole cycle. Indeed, absolutely. <clears throat> and another thing, and don't say too much, but you know, if the stats are correct, okay, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> between me and you, uh, Professor, there's five million people that are gonna watch or listen to this. If the stats are correct, there's a lot of people with depression and anxiety. I see all these people, and um, you know, I'm no doctor, but I do study this stuff heavy. I go down to my friends and look at all kinds of crazy stuff that, you know, looking at me, you would never think I would do, but I'm very interested in stuff, molecule, you know, the cancer. So I'm, I'm just very, very into that for some reason. I'm into space. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have built a successful show if you weren't intellectually curious, right? right. Otherwise, the show would have never worked. So so I can completely understand how oh, that would be. Thank you for that compliment. I pre especially from you. I, I appreciate it. So uh you just complimented now you threw me off. What was I saying? Just about you were that. talking about, about uh depression and anxiety. Yeah, and nobody that. has it. But I was just very thankful for that compliment from oh, you. No, really, really. So when you and, and they give these SRIs and I'm sure you've studied them. I've studied them with my peanut brain. 
And these SRIs, compared to, say, a Klonopin, to me, personally, if somebody has anxiety, these SRIs, I've seen these I've seen these things turn people into completely different people. I've seen them gain weight, miserable, moody, uh, and then trying to coming off of them because of the dopamine and, and serotonin levels that it messes with is a, is a disaster. Then they have anxiety. Now, you can't be happy if you have anxiety. That's a nightmare. So you... What do you say to those who are on the SRIs or on this medication that really might be making it worse? And we all know about big pharma. Everything's, well, in my opinion, big pharma is all about take this pill so you end up taking this pill so you take this pill. And then you have a lot of people with anxiety that don't want to admit it that they have it. They want to say, well, that's just me. I've been like this all my life. But meanwhile, they're a ball of nerves. Yeah. So no, I get it. Okay, yeah. so I I would answer this in a couple of ways. Number one, I just had a uh, a physician, a cardiologist on my show. His name is Asim Malhotra, and he's got. He'll be happy that I'm plugging his thing on on your show. He's got a new documentary coming out called First Do No Farm. It's based on a play on First Do No Harm yeah. by the Hippoc Hippocratic, but he he changes the word harm to farm. P H A R M meaning yeah. pharma. Oh, I know because who he is. is. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, so precisely, so yeah, precisely to your yeah. point, he's basically arguing that the medical system over medicalizes uh, people. Now, to your specific point about you know mental health issues, it really, for many things, it really is a combination both of you know lifestyle changes, uh, talk therapy, going to actually see a therapist, and in some cases, pharmacological interventions, meaning actually taking a pill. I think the problem in psychiatry is it has recently gone too far. The pendulum has too much swung to just pharmacological interventions rather than getting at the underlying root of, you know, why is it that you're feeling anxiety? So, for example, we know that of all therapeutic approaches in terms of talk therapies, one that really works well, just as well, if not better than many of the drugs, is cognitive behavior therapy, which, by the way, the, the Stoics several thousand years ago had already some of their philosophy is very much the precursor of cognitive behavior therapy. Now, what's cognitive behavior therapy? It's basically the idea that what's causing you a particular source of anxiety is that you're holding the wrong cognitions about that thing. And therefore, that's leading you down bad behavioral pathways. If I can get you to shift your cognition about this thing, then hopefully the, the anxiety symptoms will alleviate themselves. So what CBT does, cognitive behavior therapy does, is it refocuses your thinking to be you know more in line with reality. And that's exactly what the Stoics had said thousands of years ago. So, but that said, there are some mental health issues. If you're, for example, paranoid schizophrenic, yeah. That's a real That's organic, a game, yeah. exactly. That's an organic disease. We absolutely know the biological mechanism yeah. that results in that. Here is a pill. If you take it religiously, I can assure you that your symptoms will completely disappear. No more hallucinations, no more voices in your head. So for a few mental health issues, a complete pharmacological approach makes sense. Yeah. But for most other things, I completely agree with you. Simply going down, take the spill, and nothing else is not going to result in long-term cure for your symptoms. This is why, by the way, one of the best predictor of your therapist being effective with you is not whether he or she has degrees from Cornell and Harvard. It's not how many PhDs. It's if they are empathetic. Because what that basically shows you is that there is a human element in the connection and the talk therapy that is as valuable, if in many cases more so than just popping a pill. So in, in most, like most things in life, like we were talking about earlier about the inverted U, the, the, the optimal path is a combination of things. So for a few things, only pills will work. For a few things, only talk therapy is necessary. For most mental health issues, you need a bit of both. Yeah, that no, I, yeah, that's that's schizophrenia. Serious. I, I know a guy in California 
that when they were on the lockdown, he, he didn't tell anybody that he had schizophrenia. He couldn't get to his therapist, oh. jumped off jumped off his balcony. Oh. Exactly. You know, so I'm not talking about that. I, I, I mean where you're sitting there and then all of a sudden you have the anxiety and so on and so forth. I, I had it for a while <clears throat> uh, because of things, you know, shit. We would be here for three hours. If I, I, I got some stories for you, pal. Uh, I'll take one of your classes. I'll make you laugh for a decade. Uh, so I go in. Uh, my parents, I'll uh, go to a therapist. Go to th- and as soon as they said to me, hey, Tommy, how's your day? Here's your two. On- walk right out. And for some reason, I went to this one therapist. The, the last one, I said, Mom, I don't care. I'm not going because I had anxiety. I was getting in little bits of trouble when I was younger. You know, I was in South Philly shit. You know, what? It, that's, that's what happens when you're an Italian and you're in South Philly. I walk into this guy. And the first thing he says to me, and excuse my my language, he goes, what the fuck are you doing with that big gold chain on? And I said, right. you're my guy. Because he didn't ask me how my day was. Yep. How's your day? You know, do you like the sun? That wasn't for me. And for probably two months, never talked about anything but business. How are you going to go into right. a business? Because I had something going on. How are you going to go into a business with those dumb diamond earrings on? You're not going to get respect. You want to wear your diamond earrings, that's fine. But in business, you can't do that. But what he was able to do was read how I, how I am. And he knew if he approached me with the happy doodle stuff, it wasn't going to work. So for literally two months, nothing. And the girl I was with at the time, and this is, and I think you'll appreciate this, he was sick of dealing with insurance companies. So when he would write a prescription, you know, a real one that, someone who needed one, some brand names are different than generics. They're, they're not the same. You know, the purity isn't the same. So certain ones, he would have patients that really needed the brand name. Well, the insurances would give him hell all the time. And he got sick and tired of it. And he said, you know what? Cash only. If I lose everybody, I'm not dealing with them. This isn't helping my, he went cash only and ended up making more money. Okay. So, you know, I just want to say, cause it took balls to do that. So it after two months, then he started getting into things slowly, but always talking about business, you know, what I'm doing, how I'm moving. And I didn't realize it at the time, but there might have been one sentence in that hour that he would say that sometime down the road, I'd hear this prick in my head say it, <laughs> and I'd be like, ah, oh, that was him. You know, and, and I wouldn't, and I didn't have anxiety. I was making better decisions and so on and so forth. The point being is it worked for me and I was a lunatic when I was younger. I was nuts, you know, but he was able to read me. But nowadays it's so hard to find someone like that. Now, do you offer courses online? So so one of the things that I'm hoping to do uh, is to create, I mean, it's hard to, at some point not, you know, I'm very much of a purist at heart. So I just want to help people, but you, you can't, always do things for free right and so i don't mean I give free, all my, yeah. con- no no i know yeah. and so one of the things that i've been thinking about is setting up behind you know a subscription wall exactly what you just asked about whether it be uh now there's this opportunity on twitter spaces to do it locals be i don't know, if you know locals, with twitter. They- be careful with twitter yeah i know uh locals has been trying to get me to sign up with them for for several years so it's definitely on my radar. So I appreciate that question. I think that there is a great potential to be able to help a lot of people by offering these courses. I I am planning on coming down to Florida, speaking of courses, to actually uh, tape a course under the Jordan Peterson Academy. Uh, he's, his people have asked me to put together an eight-hour course that would then be hosted on his platform. But it's definitely on my mind and to your more general question uh, question i'm kind of right now at a fork in my career in that on the one hand on the one hand i've never never imagined that i could ever not be in academia to be a professor is is in my dna and it's i've always loved being an academic i i've always loved to do the scientific research and so on but the last 10 12 15 years have allowed me to expand my reach to such a level that a lot of the things that unfortunately i do in academia 
are hindering my ability to pursue some of these other opportunities, like what you just asked, offering these independent courses. Because as a professor, you know, it's a very, very full-time job. I'm applying for grants. I'm supervising doctoral students. I'm teaching courses. I'm writing academic papers. I'm serving on editorial boards. I'm sitting on a million administrative committees. So if I did nothing but my professorship stuff, I would be busy all day. And so the reason why I'm saying all this is because right now I'm at a point where I have to start thinking, so what's my next move, the next 5, 10, 20 years? Am I going to stay in academia or am I going to take the route, let's say, of how Jordan Peterson, he now retired from academia. And so to answer your question in this long-winded way, I think if I were to decide to leave academia, it would make it a lot easier for me to do the things that you asked about because then it would free up my time because I don't do things half-assed. When I do something, I want to do it full throttle. I want to do it perfectly right. I don't want to be winging it. And it's very hard to find the time to do all the things I do. I mean, even now I wear seven different hats. I'm, I appear on the media a hundred thousand times. I, I write books. I, I do shows for three hours. I, I do this. I do, right. So, so, I'm a bit in a in a pickle because on the one hand, to your point earlier about the welder who wants to leave his job and pursue his art, uh, you know, I have young children uh, that are still under our care and it's hard to walk away from a tenured professorship that you've built 30 years, it's taken 30 years to build. It, it makes you less likely to take risks because your career path is set. I've got security, you know, I've got my system set up. I've got my graduate students. So it takes a lot of guts to say, I'm I'm breaking the golden handcuffs and I'm going to pursue other opportunities. But to the earlier conversation we had about regret, I worry that in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I'll regret that I never took some of these risks because there are so many incredible opportunities for me to pursue that today I've rejected all of them because I'm tied to my academic career. Wow. So I hope I've answered your question. Well, professor, on Fridays, you could do Zoom <laughs> therapy and see how you like it without it oh, completely wow. getting in your yeah. way. Does that sound uh, familiar? Let's talk. Let's okay. talk. That sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> because uh, right now, what therapist do you go to? Who do you go to? Who can you trust? Especially in the United States. I wouldn't trust any of them other than the guy that told me I'm a jerk off because of my gold necklace. But now I, I wouldn't trust any of them. None of them. Not one of them. Not one of them. Because they would have their own agenda and in my opinion have their little script. Okay, he looks like this. He talks like this. Okay, blah, 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 blah. But you're a real guy. You have a background. You know what you're talking about. I love how you you go back into ancient because it kind of did shape us. You, you go into biology. So do it on Fridays, like you said, and see how it goes. <laughs> I think I might have to take you up on that. I think that's a very good idea. And you could still do Fridays it at home. with Dr. Sign. You'll, yeah, you better get that sign-up list. You, you, yeah, and, you know, charge and everything. And, you know, do but you it. know what? I'll ask you this. Maybe mm -hmm. th Thank you. That's a, that's a very good uh, recommendation. What is what has been your secret, if I may turn to your apparent greater expertise? How have you been able to build a platform as big as yours? Because I find that I'm completely stagnant in terms of some of those metrics. For example, my YouTube channel, despite the fact that you know I've got millions of people who know me and fall, it it just it's as if it's hit a plat somebody's pushed a button. And I could never get past a certain stage. But then I look, now I, I know you've got great content, you, you've got great guests. Thank so, you. It, you know, but, you know, I probably have, you know, one fifth the average, you know, views that you, is there something unique that you've done that, that allowed you to grow your platform the way that, that you have? I think, well, one, I, they're suppressing you for sure. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then two, when so say it's your youtube that you want to grow then you should be like like i don't know if you're on reddit i didn't see reddit up there i'm not i've never no. been on Reddit. okay no. reddit is bigger than any of them uh, as far as pointing power so for 20 years i i've coded i'm a coder right like code like behind the shit so reddit is the most powerful and the reason it is is because you have to build karma which means there's no robots in other words 
So if you go on Reddit and you post the link to whichever site you're really pushing to get more popular, that pointing power, let's just say, to make it simple, if you're pointing it, if you put the YouTube link in, the Spotify link in on Reddit, you're going to get a lot more traction that way. Then you go to like pin interest that people overlook, you know, pin interest with the little red thing. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. huge. That's huge. That, that carries I'm also not there. Right. So those two just alone, right. being the biggest, they carry a lot of weight as far as pointing power and pointing power means when you click on that and then it takes it to Spotify or YouTube, how that affects the algorithm. And then okay. that that affects the algorithm. And then once you get in the algorithm, everything starts to go up. And there's a lot more to that if you'd like me to text or email you and whatever. But yeah, but that I, might be good. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I'd be more than happy to. And on Fridays, then you got to do Zoom. So yeah. when people ask me for a therapist, because I tell everybody, if you go to a therapist, don't even talk to me. I don't even want to hear about it. You know, don't, don't, don't even, don't even want to go there. You know. Well, you know, I, I did a, I mean, it wasn't a therapy session, but I did my oh, inaugural okay. just out of the blue. I did a Twitter spaces about two weeks ago and I had 3,692 people show up on the spur of the moment. So that just blew my mind, right? I mean, I, it's not, I, I hadn't promoted it for two weeks. I hadn't done anything. I just literally opened my phone. I put out a tweet. I said, hey, I don't know how this Twitter space is works. Can somebody help me? One of my followers came in and said, hey, I will manage the whole thing for you today. We ended up spending three and a half hours wow. in an open-ended Twitter spaces wow. with 3,692 people. So there's real opportunity to do big things. I want to ask you something. I want to get back to Twitter. I want to get. Oh, I want to know what your thinking is on this because Dr. Malone, three times he came in and I fought him on this Elon thing. And but first, you stated it, and I, I'm with you. But I just want you to explain it. That happiness is a fact. And when I went, okay, so how can happiness be a fact when it's a feeling? I look at it, and then correct me or or, you know, make sure. it better. E well, either you're happy or sad, but then what defines happiness? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Three hours into our conversation. Uh, you got stamina. I mean, there are, you lost 87 pounds. Come on. If you can go two hours. <laughs> there, there, are, there are, I mean, there are different ways by which uh, we measure happiness. And even within the academic literature, there are all kinds of arcane debates distinguishing between different types of happy states, you know, uh, happiness versus well-being versus contentment. So I don't, I try to avoid those kinds of, you know, academic arcane debates. Happiness is a feeling of well-being, a feeling of existential joy. You know, you wake up in the morning, you could tell, even if you weren't able to measure it, although we could measure happiness, you know, you get a sense whether you wake up and you say the world is on my shoulders, my life sucks, everything is bleak, or whether you say life is exciting, where can I go play today? And so all that I mean by, you know, happiness is a fact is that to go back to the earlier point about the 50% genes versus 50% non-genes, yes, there is part of our happiness that is inscribed oh. in our genes, which can't alter it, right? So okay. some of us have sunny dispositions, others don't. But there's another 50% that's up for grabs. In other words, the, you are the orchestrator, the architect of your happiness. There are concrete steps that you can take that either make you improve on that score or worsen. Just like, by the way, let's go back to weight. On any given day, only one of three things can happen. I can either gain weight that day, my weight could not change that day, or I could lose weight that day, correct? Right. Now, if each of the next 18 months, the same phenomenon happens, which each and every day for 18 months, I end up on the losing weight scale, guess what? I'll get up on the scale after 18 months and I'll be 86 pound, pounds lighter, right? So it's the same thing for happiness. Imagine that happiness has this internal scale and every single day, at the end of the day, my happiness meter either went this way 
it didn't move or it went this way. And all I'm saying is it is within your willful control. There are things that you can make, you can do that improve your score. It's not a guaranteed recipe. It's not, I'm not promising you a guarantee, but I can sure promise you that if you implement these mindsets, your probability of happiness increases drastically. How do real quick question? How do you take someone who, let's say they're miserable, right? They're they're not happy, and then they find happiness. What's happy to them from all the miserable in either eating a shit ton of food or or boozing or doing any of that? And that literally is like, my life sucks, but man, this really makes me happy. Is that that's like a false happy? I guess. How do you yes. how do you do and that? The, yes, the ancient Greeks, I mean, talked about that. There are even, you know, Greek terms that when we when we mean happiness, and certainly when I mean happiness, I'm not talking about the ephemeral, the passing dopamine hit, right? So yes, I can watch a porn movie and be titillated for three minutes. That's not what we mean by happiness. I can eat a juicy steak that can give me real sensorial pleasure. That's not what we mean. At least that's not what I mean by happiness in, in this book. Happiness is a re it's an existential state of being, right? Like I wake up on any given day. Of course, I've got a million pressures. Of course, some days I wake up, I go, oh God, I've got these four meetings and I've got to file my taxes and I've got to, life sucks. But generally speaking, when I, you know, I don't sleep well at night because I'm so excited for the next day to come. And I'm so, my mind is so racy about yeah, all the too. exciting opportunities that await me the next day. Well, guess what? That's happiness, right? I mean, it, if I were unhappy, I'd say, please, God, let me sleep and may I never wake up because <laughs> yeah. I want to get the hell out of this life. I'm saying, can you please finish with the sleeping so I can wake up? Because tomorrow I'm speaking at these guys in Palm Beach and then I've got a meeting with this postdoc and then I'm going to work on the idea for my next book and then I'm going to put up my chat with Pierce Morgan that I have so many exciting things. So, you know, that's what it is. It's, it's not the hit of dopamine. It's not the uh, your favorite Philly Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Those are passing things. I'm talking about deep existential things. When you're 85 years old, you're looking back at your life, you say, Have, am I rich because I've lived a life full of brilliant experiences? If yes, you win at the game of life. That's it. Can you pull up a uh, tab too? <clears throat> so two things. Have you looked into NAD and looked at that biological at all? You know, like- No. Uh, not at all? I was just no. interested. So in the book, I. Uh, Tell us, give us another little sneak peek into it since you're keeping it held until July 25th and you should be indicted for it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I've given you a lot. Yeah, you give me I, a lot. I, you give me a uh, lot. Uh, another nugget. Okay, well, going back to the uh, marriage and finding the right spouse. So there are two uh, edicts when it comes to choosing the right spouse. One is birds of a feather flock together. And the other one is opposites attract. In other words, are we more likely to be happy when we choose a partner that is as similar to us as possible? Or are we happier when we choose a partner that is as maximally dissimilar to us? Well, it turns out, gentlemen, that for long-term relationship success, the research shows that overwhelmingly it's the birds of a feather flock together strategy that yeah. works now you the next question might be well what do you mean similar on which attributes on which dimensions well i don't mean similar that you both have green or blue eyes what what is what we mean by similar is shared values right. shared visions for life shared belief systems it it becomes a lot more difficult to build a successful long-term relationship if you score on opposite end of the spectrum on a lot of these attributes. It just increases the likelihood of you, you know, eventually breaking it up. So for example, my wife happens to be Lebanese. I didn't set out to, oh, I'm only going to marry a Lebanese uh, woman. But the fact that she is Lebanese ensured that there was a whole cultural baggage and belief system that we both came with that didn't allow us to learn these things about each other or 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 learn you know because we already come with very shared outlooks on life right 
Uh, and so that would be an important nugget that I can yeah. offer as advice to people. <clears throat> you know, birds of now the only attribute, by the way, that from an evolutionary perspective, we tend to look for someone who is dissimilar. Do you know? Can you guess what that attribute is? So, for example, I just said when it comes to beliefs, values, mm -hmm. outlooks, we tend to choose people who are similar to us. When it comes, for example, to height, we also tend to choose uh, partners such that women always want a guy who's taller than them. As a matter of fact, there was a study done with 720 couples. Out of 720 couples, only one of the 720 was the woman taller than the guy. So that would be an example, again, of what's called assortative mating. Do you know what is the one attribute on which we choose someone who is maximally dissimilar to us? Can you guess? Uh, and I, I'm not necessarily expecting you to get it, but I'm wondering yeah. if you can. Um, more adventurous. What's your guess? Oh, boy. No, it's actually a lot more basic than that. Ba more, is, more. It, is, it, is it just like if I'm like... It's physiological. If I'm, if I'm whiter than a ghost, I'm looking for someone who's a little tanner than me, or, or that's not at all. I <laughs> okay, don't know. so you mean skin color? Skin color. No, it turns out it's it's uh, smell. So, Shit. And let yeah. me let me explain this. I get so pheromones. There's, there's a, yeah, right. So there's a set of genes that it's they're called the major histocompatibility complex. Yeah. It's a set of genes that, if you like, code for your immunological profile. And that is picked up through your unique smell. Now, we tend to prefer people's smells who are maximally dissimilar to us on those genes. Why? Because you want that your children, it's like an insurance policy. You want your children to have the maximal amount of immunological defense. And, and that is picked up through smell. So for example, and this study has been done, not by me, by, by a colleague. If you bring in four people, let's say you ask them to wear a T-shirt so that their smell becomes imbued on the T-shirt. And you then take the T-shirt, you put it in four bags, and then you bring someone and you ask them to smell the four T-shirts. They will invariably pick the one that scores most dissimilar to their major mm. histocompatibility complex. So that is... By the way, that shows you that we literally are animals, right? Yeah. I mean, for those people who think biology doesn't matter, okay, what greater proof do you have that it is all biology, right? It's so, all biology. So, so, exactly. So sometimes when you're saying, you know what, I didn't feel chemistry for him or her. It, it is literally the fact that their smell was not intoxicating to you. So that is the singular attribute on which uh, the science has shown that it makes evolutionary sense for choose to choose someone who is dissimilar to you. But for all of the other important attributes, your belief systems, your your uh, your uh, uh, worldviews, your attitudes towards things, your moral code, it is much, much better to choose someone who is exactly the same as you. You're very good at explaining yeah. things. You're very, you're well, very good at breaking things down. Well, that's very sweet. Thank you so much. I guess I've had a lot of uh, experience <laughs> over the year in doing so. But but it's very kind of you to say because it speaks to remember when I said that today at the cafe a guy came up to me and you know put his arms around me and said, "Oh, I just watched you on the show." He said the exact same thing you said. So it it means a lot to me. And ultimately that's the that's the dopamine that I get. Yeah. That, that, that's the hit that I get when someone posts a selfie of them, you know, I mean, think about it. They could have, when they're on vacation, there is a million things that they could be doing when they're sitting on that beach, including choosing a different, a million different books other than mine. So when they are choosing your book to read on that beach, yeah. boy, that says something really special. Of all of the choices they could have made that day, they chose you. What could be more enriching than that? I Hold mean, even on. Though Hold on. You got that one wrong. I'm going to make you feel even better. Forget the book. Okay. Forget a book. If you have somebody sitting on the beach and they're not on the phone watching some stupid TikTok thing <laughs> or some dumb reel or texting, or texting some moron and they have your book, that dopamine better be shooting out of your brain and the serotonin better be going out of your brain because that is that's the one not the book not the book just somebody having a book alone i'm happy to see that somebody's still reading books yeah. 
But to get, but if they have your book and not on the phone, shit. What if it's an audio book? Audio book, fine. All right. I, I got you know. I, he's coming Speaking out with of which, he's coming out with a CD of, too. Speaking <laughs> of which, the number one. The number one and only criticism I had for my last book, The Parasitic Mind, was that people were very upset that it wasn't narrated by me. And I would be and, too. I read it. Well, but here's the thing. I keep telling people the ultimate decision is not mine to make. So that even though I understand that when people get to know you and they want to feel connected to you, they want to hear the stories about your personal life and your voice, uh, and so I, it's funny that we're that I'm mentioning this because earlier today, this morning, I received an email from my publisher. This is the first time that I'm saying this in public. And they gave me three samples of three different narrators for oh. the sad truth about happiness. Tell and so I wrote them. back to them and I said, guys, I thought we had already gone through this, that there was a complete revolt from, from, from people saying that I should read it in my own voice. But I haven't checked their response yet, but... Just for people to know, whoever is listening to the show, I am desperately trying to be the narrator. Well, but I can't. Professor, uh, what did you say earlier? You said that one of the things you do so well is that you are able to write a book, but write it in a story like a story like that you write it, but it's got to come from you. I know. I I count to kick dust. The only thing I could think of, the only reason I could think of why they are resistant to that, it it must be some either logistical or financial issue because they have to then fly me. I think they're, I don't know, the audio publisher, I think is out of Portland. So they, Portland, Oregon, I think. They fly you out. They have to pay for this. That, so, but I'm thinking that, and I don't know if this is true or not. I, I'm thinking that me reading my book will result in a sufficiently greater number of sales that it would be worth whatever additional expense you have to pay me for me to do it. It will, takes about 50% more. You think so? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. I've had, how many people have we had? Yeah. And I'm not bragging. Look, you're right. man, you're the man of all men. And, and you know I'll save it for when you come in because I'm really interested how you got out of your country. But I don't want to keep you here all day because you got all kinds of stuff to do. But how many people have we had in that we got their, they were number 7,010 gazillion. We got them to number one at least for a week or two after they came on the thing. You got to read wow. that book. Play, you buy it. You buy the plane ticket. Fly out there. You'll make it back. Tell them, no, I'll fly out there. I'll right. make it. So remove the financial costs. Yep. Okay, Fuck gotcha. it. Yeah, and go out there. You read it. I'm telling you, it will be at night and day. Think how you went on Twitter just out of nowhere and got 300,000 people. No, three, no, no, 3,000. Okay, 3, whatever. I wish it was, Same yeah. thing. 3,000 yeah. in, in no time with no promotion, no anything. You got to yeah. do it. You can't have some whoever reading it. They want you. People want you with the voice, with the sarcasm, blah, blah. What, what was, he's going to read off a thing like this that they paid $10 to. No, no. He, you got to read this one. If that means you, you know got to pay to fly out there, I, fuck I, it. I might, I might need to to have you send me the snippet of the last minute and my reply to my publisher is you saying that. Maybe that will convince him. Because I I know that Joe Rogan, I don't know if it was the last time I was on a show, he was chastising me. He's like, what the hell are you doing? Why didn't you read the book? And I told him, hey, here's what Joe said. And they're like, doesn't matter. The audio publisher has their own procedure. So it, I don't know why they're so resistant, but it's a mystery. They're morons. T- tell them you'll pay for it. You'll fly out there. And then while you're out there, you come right to here and promote it even more. There you go. And then I can I ask you, you a bunch of other questions and get you guys hooked on Palm Beach. You got to read that. Yeah. I look forward to it. I can't I can't wait to meet you guys in person. This this is <laughs> hey, you guys just reached Joe Rogan level. We've been we've been at it for three hours. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can keep going. I I can keep going. Do you usually go that long? Yeah, yeah. Okay, wow, that's because one thing I I copied a lot off of Joe Rogan not because like I want to bang him or anything. I I just like the way he does things. You know, people blah blah blah. blah. I like the way he does it. So when guests come up, I'm very interested. So like you're, I'm very interested in you. So I could go on and on with you because I want to learn. 
Yeah. You know, I want to learn yeah. things. It's very, it's very like we're just sh- sitting here shooting the shit, and he's right. Yeah. Like I know him. We, we'd be here for three more hours, but that's a that's a that's a good thing because it's engaging, and you're you're yeah. Like I'm sitting here, I'm like, man, like this stuff we're learning, and hopefully the viewers are going to listen to and take away instead of some guy who's like, yeah, you know, I. Uh, I won the Super Bowl, which is great. And then, you know, there's no other story. I won't mention the one guy we had on, but it was awful. Yeah. But yeah. I won't say the name. I <laughs> yeah. won't say the name. So, uh, you have this. Uh, blah, blah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, uh, what color is the sky? By the way, yeah, yeah. that speaks to having profundity, right? I always. So now, for example, I'm trying to teach my daughter. I have, I have, I have, I have two children, but uh, my son is a bit younger, but he hasn't reached it. So I'm trying to teach my daughter about the importance of reading, right? Because, you know, the the knowledge that I have that I can share with people that makes me interesting to talk. I mean, part of it, of course, is your personality. It's whatever charisma you have. But if I don't have interesting things to say, I can't maintain your interest for three hours. But you talk about this, I can pull these studies. You talk about that, I could tell you this story. So part wisdom, part experience, part book knowledge, put it all together, you become someone interesting that people want to listen to. And so I'm trying to explain to my daughter that all of the, I mean, she's a teenager, it's normal. She she likes to do some of that silly stuff, but please read because yeah. you could never be someone that is profound, void of you know, having that knowledge in your brain, right? That's what allows me to roll with the punches. I could go to Stanford University and be incredibly professorial and austere and formal, or I can sit with a bunch of, uh, you know, corrections officers and be one of the guys. And the ability to to be, you're talking about changing, right? Chameleon, I'm not changing in a sinister way, but being able to adjust to different audiences, to be able to alter your communication style so that everybody feels that they're being spoken to rather than spoken at, that you don't appear arrogant. That's a very difficult skill to have. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why many professors don't succeed out of their lanes because they're used to only speaking in a particular way. I only speak to the anointed ones that are in my ivory tower. I don't talk to the great unwashed, the rubes, the plebs. I'm not like that. I, I I revel in having the 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 cop or the truck driver write to me and saying, "My God, I've been I've been reading, I've been listening to your book on audio. I can't get enough of it." That gives me a lot more pleasure than some fancy professor from Harvard, you know. So you, you have then, to. I don't. That. I don't know if you've had it, but it, it would be interesting if you have it. That truck driver, if you had them in on your podcast oh, yeah. and just talk to them. So why did you? You know, read, I've thought about that. How I've fun would that be, that. though? Right? It would just be a different lane and interesting for you. Hundred. As a matter of fact, here's what I thought I've thought of doing as a as a you know like a, a side thing. You know, there's a show that used to happen in Canada. Uh, I don't remember the name of the show, but he the guy would just show up with this purple couch. He plop it somewhere on the street, <laughs> and he put let's say a, you know. Today, I want to talk about, uh, you know, infidelity. And then he would film people as they. And so I thought, you know, I just I just want to put out a call and just bring a just a regular person. Not an. Here's what has stopped me, gentlemen. You don't know what you're going to get. Right. So so the guy that I speak to might turn out to be the most exhilarating fantastic person and i'm so fortunate that we've been able to have this chat that truck driver or he may be an insane dud (laughs) yeah and then you know so i I often tell my wife as we're walking by a whole bunch of people let's say 500 people i say how many people if i were able to find out what their story is they'd have an incredible story to tell well i'm sure many but how do i find which one it is that's the trick yeah, <clears throat> Google them or, or look them up and 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 fine because I I think I think you'd have great interest in that. I just just have you both. have you ever brought someone like that? Just oh yeah, like I've gone from sitting with Peter McCullough for five hours, Malone for four and a half hours, three times, uh, Doctor Epstein five hours to my barber, mm-hmm. my barber. I just wanted to know. Wow, he, he had come from Cuba, and he was trying to get his father over. I wanted to sit with him and know like. 
What is it like, you know, your family's in Cuba, you're trying to make money, you have to send money there, you're trying to learn the language here. What is that like? It was interesting to me. You know, what is it like to live like that? Yeah, I, I go all over the place. So what I've done, as maybe you might have guessed, is I do exactly that in my personal life, right? Yeah. So so, so I, have, I haven't brought the barber and the truck driver on my show but I have met the barber and the truck driver in my daily life. So I will sit sometimes at a cafe and, you know, people recognize me. So they come up at first, you know, they're afraid, they're shy, they don't want. And then I make the time, right? I stand and I, and then, you know, they're amazed, right? They're like, I, I can't believe how a regular guy you are. But what? I am a regular guy. I just happen to, you know, to have interesting things to say. And, and I think that that, you know, humility even draws people more wow. to you yeah. so, sometimes people think when i when i go after someone hard on twitter let's say because they're being an imbecile that oh i've got a chip on my shoulder i mean that's such an idiot because i'm exactly the opposite of that and it actually pisses me off when someone thinks that of me maybe i should be more stoic and not care what people think but and by the way i'll just tell you this i i won't mention my name the a name unless you were to force me to there's someone recently You're more than welcome to. I don't care. <laughs> very, very, very high profile guy who was one of I was one of the few people he followed. And I was happy about that. Who recently unfollowed me. And I thought, what a punk. What a little castrato, right? Because yeah. not that I think so highly of myself, but there is absolutely no conceivable reason why someone would say, you know, I've come in contact with this guy's content and I've now decided it's a, you know, the, remember the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, the Roman emperor yeah. Yeah, I've decided so, yeah. unfollow. And so I take great pride in being approachable to everyone and because I, I'm enriched by everybody's story. So maybe I'll take you up on your, uh, <laughs> that's his law bringing though. in the trucker. Yeah. That's if, his if, loss. If, 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 if if I do, thank you. I appreciate that. If I do, I'll give you a shout out that you were the one oh, who. Uh, thank you. Yeah. But think about it, if you can sit with them in a cafe, and then you talk to them. Think how interesting for you, who has all these degrees and everything else. You sit with the trucker. What made you become a trucker? What's it like when you got to go for ninety six hours on that truck? You know, I think not. Now you would be the one yeah. interested. You know, on things that 100%. you're, you know, I think it would be, and then it makes you more but, but, like uh, and, and, relatable too. And that's the hard. Stop pulling way, back. Stop pulling back. That, that's what all. If if you look at all the guys, whether it be Joe Rogan, whether it be you, whether it be Megan, anyone who has built a platform that hundreds of thousands of people say, of all the things I can do today, I'm choosing that platform to go spend my time. I think there's one thing they share in common. It's not that they all have fancy degrees. It's not that they're all neurosurgeons. It's that they are all intellectually curious and inquisitive. So that if you watch Joe Rogan, right? How can he go one day from speaking to Sir Roger Penrose, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and the next day he's speaking to a comedian whose every second word is F this and F that? <laughs> it's because... He, he is open-minded. He's adjustable. He doesn't have a... He's intellectually curious. He's playful. Those are the things that the camera doesn't lie on, right? That's why I've been able to, you know, go from, you know, being in the fancy-schmancy world of academia to, you know, I'm a one-man show, right? I don't have producers. I don't have... But it's my authenticity. I open the thing. Let's talk. Let's... And as you... I, I don't know how much you know my stuff... I'm also oh, confident it. enough to do a lot of skits that are completely non-professorial, right? When I, I don't know if you've seen me when I'm self-flagellating <laughs> yeah. myself, yeah. right? I, I do I do the bit where I hide under the desk because I'm so afraid that Donald Trump, right? Yeah. So I don't take <laughs> myself so seriously. Now, some people will write to me and say, oh, but you know, when you do these things, you damage your brand as a professor. <laughs> Listen, if being joyful and fun damages my reputation as a professor, then I'm not a very good professor, right? I don't have no. to put on an air of full profundity for people to take me seriously. And and actually, that's exactly what Megan Kelly in the quote that you quoted, that's exactly what she's saying, right? He, I'm playful. And, and that's why I think 
a lot of academics, because I get academics who write to me and say, well, okay, I'd like to kind of get into that space. How? What are some secrets? What's the secret sauce? I say, well, here's number one. Don't take yourself so seriously, no. well, right? I... You can't you can't talk the 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 super fancy academic. Not not that I I won't use good vocabulary when I'm speaking to you, but I know how to modulate myself in order to draw as much excitement from the audience, right? I remember I when I was I hadn't yet uh, written Parasitic Mind, and an agent had written to me wanting to represent me. And one of the things he said, he goes, you know what? You need to make sure to write the parasitic mind uh, in the way that you appear on Joe Rogan so that it's not all just professor. Now, I knew that already, and that's how I wrote the book. There is a lot of fancy academic stuff, but there's a lot of sarcasm. There's a lot of joking around. There's a lot. And I think it's that mix that makes people you know, come back. And that's, I think, why you've been a very successful show. Oh, thank you. And yourself, you're fun. You're fine. You'll you'll go into the, into the you know Mr. Degree thing, but then you'll explain it in in human terms. Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, what I mean? and that, that's what I take away from it here. I think yeah. I think you should teach more teachers or professors. Hell yeah, how to because that's that's what the, the, that's the crossroads we're at. Like, you know, school schooling for kids sometimes they hate it, and why? Because they go in there and the professor just goes. Blah 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 blah, and they're turned off. They're done. They turned off. Yeah, you know, and and I think what you do and the way you do it speaks profoundly because, you know, I try to tell my son. I have two kids. I tell both of my boys. Like, my wife laughs. I'll be in the grocery store and I'll talk to a ninety-year-old guy. She's like, "We gotta go." Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, "Well, you never know what you learn from somebody or the stories that yeah. you hear." So I try to teach my kids instead of being on the phone the whole time. And doing nothing, talk to people, interact with people. And you do it in a way where, like I said, you're not throwing out these big terms where I'm sitting there going, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> you know, but that that's respectable, and I appreciate that. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I appreciate those words. Pull up uh, the professor's book again. Uh, it's coming out uh, ju uh, June 1st, right? <laughs> ju <laughs> July 25th. July 25th. Oh, by, but you can pre-order now. Yes, you can pre-order now. I'm wondering, guys, do, do you have a sense of, so let's say the book were already out now, so we can say, okay, I can I can predict that it will do very well in terms of sales after the show happens. Does that also happen as easily with the pre-orders or are people more reticent to pre-order just because they put it off to some future date when the book comes out? What, what's your sense about that? In my opinion, I think they put it off. They go look at it. They see it. They say in their head, oh, yeah, I got to yeah. come back for this. But it's July and they forget. With you, it's, it's different. because, And I'm not saying it because I'm talking to you. Right. But I, I think you lo you would lose. But I could be wrong. I, I don't know. You know, I don't I don't know. I, don't, I really wait, hope that. What do you think? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, pre-order. Um, He's me, been in media me, a long time. So me personally, me personally, and this is just my opinion. What I would do is, uh, like I said, you said July. I said okay. I guess it's just the marketing, right? Like if if I feel yeah. like oh shit, I gotta get this and it's gonna sell out, and I may not have it, then I might be like, all right, I gotta go get this because this is gonna sell out. Let's just use that for an example. But if I know like okay, they've made a million copies or whatever, and I'm gonna be able to get it. I'll probably just wait, wait till it comes Put out. Put it off, yeah. Yeah, that's just me. Well, here's, can I make a pitch to your audience yeah. uh, as to why they shouldn't put it off? Sure. Uh, so, here's what happens when you when you pre-order a book, it doesn't go into the sales like the realized sales until the first day that the official book is launched. So let let's suppose right now there are ten thousand pre-orders that are locked and loaded that we know, right? So now July 25th comes around. That first day, those 10,000 pre-orders get counted as sales, which now why is that important? Because when the weekly bestsellers lists come out, then it gets counted straight cumulatively, all of them as that Number week's one. sales. Yeah. And once you get into right off the bat into the bestsellers list, then it becomes a domino effect because then 
if it's on the best sellers one week, it's more likely to stay longer. And, and then it becomes, as I said, a domino effect, like an avalanche. So to those people who have listened to this chat, if I can engage in, sure. you know, an appeal, the people who've listened to this said, you know what? I loved what these guys were talking about. I want to get this. It really matters that you pre-order it because then it guarantees that the sale is going to be counted right off the bat. And that greatly increases my chances of getting on the bestsellers list. So please, please, please consider pre-ordering it. Yeah. That's it. That's the end of my spiel. It's awesome. And then uh, you should come in July 25th. That's when you should be here. You can ask, hey, you can ask uh, Dowd, Robert Dowd. They were suppressing him on uh, Calls Unknown. He came on, and I'm not saying it's because of me. It could have been a bunch of other things, but he went from him being suppressed to a bestseller. Hey, who was this? Uh, uh, Robert Dowd. He did a book called Cause Unknown on uh, okay. COVID, like killing these young kids uh, with Robert Kennedy uh, Art Jr., oh, right. who, yes, YouTube, yes. who YouTube uh, suspended me for two weeks because of Robert Kennedy Jr., the name Robert Yikes. Kennedy Jr. Yeah. Right. Wow. Fucking Democrat. Uh, I, I heard you I, like Cher, whatever his name is over there, too. I heard he's a great guy. It, Justin Trudeau? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's my he's my hero. Uh, you, that's what I've you, been hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I warned Canadians from well before he became prime minister. I kept screaming from top of the mountain. And now I get a lot of people who write to me and say, boy, I should have listened to you. But, but that speaks to how fickle the human mind is, which is that, and this actually is something that I discuss in the parasitic mind. People use these cosmetic cues, these peripheral cues in judging politicians. Oh, he's tall. Oh, he's got beautiful hair. Oh, he's young. Oh, he's going to legalize marijuana. But they don't look at the substantive cues. This is why I, you may or may not have seen me do this. Let me just, I'm going to bring a prop. Imagine for a second that this is a, have you seen my uh, getting drunk by the cork? Of the wine bottle, have you seen this? That one no? I didn't see. No. So, so there's an expression in Arabic that basic, which when you translate it to English means getting drunk simply by smelling the cork of the wine bottle. Now, what does that mean? That means that you are of such weak constituency that oh. you don't need to actually do the hard work of drinking the wine to get drunk. You just take a whiff and you're already drunk. Now, how do you apply it here? So, look, nice. look. Now, I'm gonna get drunk by the cork of the Obama wine, right? Yeah. Oh, he's he's tall, he's thin, he's got a mellifluous voice. You see, I'm getting drunk. Every single syllable he says is pure, utter bullshit. But look, I'm getting drunk. Yeah. So that's what happened with Justin Trudeau, right? And Obama. He is so, and Obama. He got me drunk. Dreaming. I actually thought and, he was all right at first. By the way, it, it works in the opposite way with uh, Trump. Oh, he's disgusting. I hate him. He's an ogre. I didn't tell you that I hate him because of policy A, B, or C. It's only because of the way mm -hmm. he speaks. He's got a brash style. He's crude. He's a Queens guy. He's vulgar. It has nothing to do with his immigration policy or his fiscal policy or his tax policy, but I'm getting drunk by smelling the cork of the wine bottle. So that's what happens, unfortunately, with with the most important decision that we make as as a citizen, which is choosing our leaders, yeah. we choose them based on their height, based on... So someone like Robert Kennedy Jr., he may have great ideas, but I can assure you that a lot of people are not going to get past the fact that his, his vocal cords are, are not very pleasant, are shot, and many people are saying, that guy is not presidential, I can't be having this guy as my president, and yet he might have the greatest ideas in the world, I'll never listen to them because I can't stand his voice. And all he did was forward the book, <clears throat> but just because of the name. And the reason why they did it is because they don't want, here, here in the state, they don't want anybody to get in the way of Biden. And they're worried right. to death about Trump, as they should be. And I'm not right. I'm not blue. I'm for what's good. Like Trump, hate him. I don't care. You look at that man's policies. Hey, I mean, his policies seem to work pretty damn good. Yeah. And I and I've had all and I've had all of them into my podcast and I I've heard everything about everyone except for Trump, other than you know the way he talks and speaks. But nobody with the agenda. I wanted to really get into you with Elon, but I'm sure you got other stuff to go. But I will say that Dr. Malone was right, in my opinion, was he told me a year and a half ago that he's part of it. 
he's gonna use Twitter as a uh, what do you say a weapon. weapon. And he would text me and throw me little hints to make me dissect them. You know, Dr. Robert Malone. Of course, I yeah, do. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually really good friends with him. With the, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he likes me for some reason, and uh, for and, many reasons, I'm sure. And I said to him, and and I tweeted him when he put in that lady, who is the most censorous broad you could ever put in. I mean, Jesus. Oh, like, you mean the new CEO? You're the new about. CEO. Yeah, she's yeah, all yeah, for yeah. the COVID shot. She she's everything opposite that Elon said he was going for. So I go to tweet, and I, then I won't hold you up too long and save my other thousand questions for when you come in. So I go to tweet to Doctor Malone, and I say, "All right, Malone, I was the moron that didn't listen to you. I'm going to listen to you now about everything else. I could send you a screenshot of it. They censored me." They said, he, wow. here at Twitter, uh, we don't like vulgar uh, tweets. After he got Tucker. After he got everybody yes. to move over. After the blue thing where you could buy it. So he gets well, all these people to move over. Boom. Well, then then, then I will share, Then, in the spirit of reciprocity, I will share the name of the very high-profile guy who unfollowed me. Drum roll, it is... Go ahead, close it. Let me hear. Elon Musk. Elon, Elon Musk. Wow. So e Elon Elon was following me out and out very very early, like in the in the wow. you know he was following very few people. He was right. And that that Elon to me was, right. was was exciting, and I don't care. Like I'm not like oh Elon, I don't care. But to me, it mattered because Elon Musk has a very very large platform. Wow. Yeah. I'm in the business of trying to spread good ideas so when you get someone with his platform that can hopefully help you amplify your voice and by the way i had said nothing but wonderful things about him i have a whole bunch of sad even before he followed me and you know i he was weighing in on some things he it seemed like he was a fan and people were saying oh my god i can't believe elon musk follows you okay great no problem then one day someone I, I think there was like a bot that 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 keeps track of who elon follows and who he unfollows people started tagging me saying oh elon musk unfollowed you i said that that can't be that doesn't make sense i go and check and he had unfollowed me and i just thought look he doesn't owe me anything but what a punky move like it it makes no sense right he's like the arm he, he's the arm everybody's looking at obama gates biden he's the i'm gonna come save twitter come move over so i can get your data i'm gonna encrypt malone said this specifically and not only malone who the hell else was it that was up there on malone's level maybe peter mccall yeah, peter bro they were like, look, this is what he is. But like, no way. This guy has invented everything. You can't take away from what he's invented, but he's a part of them. What, there's yeah. no explanation why he would put that woman in there. Unfollow you. I put Malone up on Twitter, which I never used Twitter. I would just read stuff. But I said, oh, I, I fell for it. Even though I had these guys that are a thousand times smarter than me, telling them, no, no, no. I put Malone up. I lose 62,000 followers. All of a sudden, wow. I, it drops sixty-two thousand, and I think, wow. oh, you know, did I do something wrong? Whatever. So, in my opinion, wow. Malone was right, and then he unfollowed you for no reason. It is crazy over here, buddy. Hmm. What are you gonna do? Nothing. Not you everybody do. loves you. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Let them be with the agenda. They'll burn one day somehow. There you go. By the way. Speaking of Palm Beach, it, Worth Street is on is in is in Palm Beach, correct? Half a mile down the street. Okay. If you take Quick your wife there, you better have your uh, wallet ready. I know, I know. Yeah. I, I I was there last year. Okay. Quick story. I discovered the greatest antiquarian bookstore on Worth Street. Do you it. know it? Yep, it's right on Worth Street. There's a place called Taboo for lunch. I don't know if you went there for lunch, maybe. I didn't know. Didn't go there for lunch. Okay, it's uh maybe midway, midway down Worth Street. The street. So I, I walk in. This was last uh, about almost a year ago now. Oh, I think it was. I think I was. I had gone to do Patrick Bet David. Yeah, show. Yeah, in, in, yeah. But he's further south. But anyways. Yeah. So we were in Palm Beach. I find this uh, antiquarian bookstore. And there was a, and I actually, I took a video of it and I posted it all, all over social media. They had a copy. So 
as an evolutionist, of course, I love Charles Darwin. I love yeah, Darwin. Origin of Species, which is an 1859 book. They had a first edition, $400,000. So wow. you can bet that whenever I will have the pleasure of coming to seeing you in person, the first place I'm going to go visit is that antiquarian bookstore. And if there are any billionaires listening who want to donate four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> yeah, to, to the Doctor God Sad Fund, so he can get a first edition of Origin of Species, uh, I'll share the uh, the wire transfer uh, route with you soon. And you can start with our pre-ordering, which will be in the link at the top. It will say your name, and the link will be right there before I even get into all the great things that you are. So it's right in front, and when you click on it, it will take you right to uh, Amazon. It won't be the bullshit thing that other people do on Spotify and others and don't put the, own, the link in where it takes you to the site. So we'll take it right there along with everything else. And uh, get here as soon as you can, man. You'll, you'll have a blast Thank here. You so much. You guys have been such a joy to talk to. Thank you so yeah, much. You. I'm so glad that uh, I came on. Thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you in person. You'll be here soon, please. Please Thank make you time so much, to come. Guys. Thank Pleasure you. talking to you. Very Thanks fun. So you have a great day, sir. You too. Thank you, guys. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by Aurora. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years, this crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet despite this, those who have had their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aurora, who is sponsoring this video. Aurora is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all into one easy-to-use app. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Protect you and your family from America's fastest-growing crime. Try Aurora for free for two weeks and see if you or anyone in your family's personal information has been compromised. Start your free trial today. Go to Aurora.com slash MSCS. The link is in the description below.